Pray for the soul of the evil, the evil man responsible for this because he's going to need it. On the morning of August 15, 1975, at precisely 11.23 a.m., a phone call was made to the Marple Police Department. The caller was David Zanstra, a minister who had also happened to be in charge of a summer Bible camp. His report was chilling. An eight-year-old girl named Gretchen Harrington had disappeared. Gretchen had set out from her home in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, with the intention of walking to the camp, which was less than a half a mile away. But she never arrived. A frantic search for Gretchen was immediately initiated, but it yielded no results. Two months later, on October 14, 1975, Gretchen's skeletal remains were found in a nearby Ridley Creek State Park. Despite this shocking revelation, the crime remained unsolved, leaving the community bewildered and anxious. So, what happened to Gretchen after she set out for the summer Bible camp? Would the truth about Gretchen's disappearance and death come to light? Today's case takes us to Marple Township, which is located in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, United States. As of 2015, it had a population of more than 23,000 people. Marple Township is home to a number of interesting attractions, including the Broomall Fields and Marple Gardens. Marple Township is a relatively safe place to live. With a crime rate that is lower than the national average, its crime score of 0.17 makes it one of Pennsylvania's safest towns. It was here that Gretchen Harrington's story began. On June 13, 1967, Gretchen Eleanor Harrington was born to Harold Boyd Harrington and Ina Harrington. At the time, her father Harold worked as a minister at a Presbyterian church. I grew up here and um, she lived down at the bottom of the hill, the church. Her, her father was a pastor down there. For Jacqueline Morgan, she has haunting memories of a case that gripped Broomall, Delaware County for 48 years. Others also immediately thought back to August of 1975 and the disappearance of eight-year-old Gretchen Harrington. Hundreds would search for her shortly after she vanished from her Lawrence Road home. Do you remember that being a, a scary time where people were just kind of... Yes, yes, yes. People were definitely afraid to let their kids out. In addition to her parents, Gretchen had two older sisters named Zoe and Harriet. Gretchen's family described her as a person who radiated kindness and had a sweet and gentle nature. By 1975, at the age of eight, Gretchen was attending second grade at Delaware County Christian School in Newtown Square. Everything appeared to be going well for Gretchen and her family until a tragic event disrupted their lives. On the morning of August 15, 1975, Gretchen left home to attend a summer Bible camp program. This camp had two locations. The first was Trinity Church Chapel Christian Reformed Church, where a man named David Zanstra served as a pastor. The second location was the Reformed Presbyterian Church, where Gretchen's father, Harold, was the pastor. The Bible camp activities took place in the morning at the first church, and afterwards, David would transport the children to the second church. The Harrington and Zanster families were well acquainted with each other. They lived nearby, and both fathers worked as pastors, while both mothers played the traditional role of a pastor's wife. In fact, one of Zanster's daughters was Gretchen's best friend. Gretchen's journey that day was unusual. Typically, she would be walking to the summer Bible camp program with her two sisters, 12-year-old Zoe and 11-year-old Harriet. It was their daily routine. However, on that particular day, their mother Ina had just given birth to a baby named Jessica and was bringing the newborn home. Zoe and Harriet chose to stay back and await their return. Despite this change in routine, Harold, Gretchen's father, encouraged her to go to the summer Bible camp program to maintain her perfect attendance record. And so Gretchen embarked on the walk alone as her father bid her farewell. It was just past 9 a.m. when she began her stroll up the hill towards Trinity. Harold kept a watchful eye on her as she proceeded along Lawrence Road. Little did he know that once she was out of his sight, it would mark the last time he would ever see his daughter alive. In the 1970s, in a peaceful suburban place like Marple, it was entirely normal to see children walking alone on sunny summer days. The idea of danger didn't even cross people's minds. This was a time when kids freely played until late in the evening. They roamed the streets, ventured into the woods, and even cooled off at Darby Creek, which flowed behind Gretchen's house without any worries. 
children would walk to their friends' houses blocks away without any aid of cell phones or GPS watches to keep them connected to their parents. Marple was simply an exceptionally safe place. That's precisely why many longtime Philadelphians chose to move there in the 1960s. Gretchen was supposed to be at Trinity Chapel Christian Reformed Church by 9.30 a.m., but she didn't arrive as scheduled. The first inkling that something was amiss came when Harold noticed her absence around 11 a.m. A group of Gretchen's friends had come to the front door of the residence looking for her. Worried and unable to locate Gretchen within the classes or nearby, Harold took immediate action. He phoned the Trinity Chapel Christian Reformed Church and spoke with Maggie Zanstra, David's wife, in an attempt to determine his daughter's whereabouts. However, he was told she hadn't been seen. Following this, the Marple Township Police Department was contacted by David, and Gretchen was formally reported as missing. Gretchen's disappearance sent shockwaves through Brumall and Marple Township. By the following day, August 16, 1975, an extensive search effort involving hundreds of people was underway to find her. This included volunteer firefighters and canine units, who scoured both sides of the creek, fields, and wooded areas. A Pennsylvania State Police helicopter continuously scanned the area from above. However, on August 17, 1975, just two days after Gretchen went missing, the police had to call off the large-scale search operation because they had very little information to work with. The police chief, Daniel Hennessy, candidly admitted to a local newspaper that they had no clues regarding her whereabouts. This situation threw the entire town into a state of panic shaking the community's sense of security to its core. Remember that being a, a scary time where people were just kind of... Yes, 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 people were definitely afraid to let their kids out. In response, friends and family members started distributing flyers to passing motorists in the area. These flyers featured Gretchen's most recent school photo, showcasing her with a missing tooth and a cheerful childlike grin. The absence of information led to a surge in speculation and countless unanswered questions. Did she run away? Did she accidentally drown in the creek? Could a stranger have abducted her, or was it someone she knew? The mystery surrounding Gretchen's disappearance left everyone deeply concerned and bewildered. In the days that followed after Gretchen vanished, the police worked to gather information and understand the events surrounding her disappearance. One of their key interviews took place on August 19th, when they spoke with David. During this conversation, David disclosed that he had indeed transported a group of children to the church on the day Gretchen disappeared. However, he stated that he had not seen her on that particular day. As August turned into September, Gretchen's sisters, Zoe and Harriet Harrington, resumed attending Delaware County Christian School. However, their fellow students found it difficult to approach them or engage in conversation, unsure of what to say in the face of such a heart-wrenching situation. When traditional investigative methods yielded no results, the police decided to pursue an unconventional avenue in their search for Gretchen. They turned to the assistance of a psychic named Judith Richardson Hames. Judith was known for using her psychic abilities to aid law enforcement in solving nearly 100 criminal cases, particularly those involving missing children. In September 1975, Judith sat down with police officers and she made a prediction that she herself hoped would prove to be incorrect. According to her psychic insights, she believed that Gretchen was dead. A month later, on October 14, 1975, a jogger exploring Ridley Creek State Park stumbled upon a decaying body hidden in the forest. Initially unsure of what he had come across, his uncertainty vanished when he noticed a human fingernail. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, the jogger promptly contacted the police. Gretchen's parents examined the distinctive clothing discovered with the remains, and they confirmed it was hers. Subsequently, the medical examiner matched the body to Gretchen using dental records. The tragic conclusion was that Gretchen's death had resulted from homicide. The forensic examination revealed that her skull had sustained multiple fractures, indicating a severe beating. Although the police initially suspected abuse, the autopsy did not yield any concrete evidence to support this hypothesis. On Sunday, October 19, 1975, just a few days after Gretchen's body was discovered, her father Harold stood at the pulpit and delivered a deeply emotional sermon. In his heart-wrenching address, he spoke of Gretchen's faith in Christ. 
he pointed out that she was now free from this world, but her murderer remained bound by their terrible actions. Gretchen's funeral was a somber event, and David officiated the service for the eight-year-old. Following the ceremony, she was laid to rest in Meridian Line Cemetery, situated in Johannesburg, Michigan, USA. Meanwhile, the discovery of Gretchen's body in the woods ignited renewed fervor for the investigation. Witnesses began to step forward, sharing accounts of various individuals they had seen in the vicinity where Gretchen's body was found. These eyewitness reports provided descriptions of men who had been in the area. As a result, the police received a flood of tips from the community, with some seeming more promising than others, while others turned out to be unrelated or unhelpful in the pursuit of justice. Investigators examined a range of potential suspects, even scrutinizing individuals with prior criminal records residing in the vicinity. Despite their efforts, no significant leads emerged, and the evidence box stored at Marple Township Police Department headquarters began to gather dust. This box contained a trove of materials, including reel-to-reel -reel tape interviews, photographs, and memoranda, all relevant to the case, but the lack of progress had it sitting idle. As time passed, the investigation into Gretchen's disappearance grew cold, occasionally during roll call meetings or when a detective had a spare moment in an otherwise uneventful week. They would revisit the case. They would look through the file, hoping to spot something they had missed before. But each time, it seemed like a futile effort. The leads always led to dead ends, leaving them frustrated and without any breakthroughs in the case. For many decades, there were no developments in the case the original detectives who had been working on Gretchen's disappearance had either passed away or retired. However, in the fall of 2022, there was a significant turn of events. A woman whose name was not released to the public reached out to the Marple Police Department, expressing her desire to discuss Gretchen's disappearance and murder. At the time, Nick Coffin, a sergeant, had taken charge of Gretchen's cold case. Therefore, when this woman contacted the Marple Police, her message was directed to Coffin's phone. The woman informed Coffin that she believed she had information about who might have been responsible for Gretchen's tragic fate. She also mentioned an attempted kidnapping incident that had occurred around the same time, raising suspicions of a possible connection. This unexpected contact rekindled hope for solving the long-standing mystery surrounding Gretchen's disappearance and murder. On January 2, 2023, state troopers arranged an interview with the woman identified only by her initials, SF, denoting her as a confidential informant. This interview would prove to be a momentous breakthrough in a cold case that had remained unresolved for nearly five decades. According to SF, she had been a schoolmate of Gretchen and one of her sister, Zoe. SF also disclosed to investigators that she had been friends with David Zanstra's daughters and frequently visited the Zanstra residence, even staying overnight on occasions. During one of these sleepovers, when she was 10 years old, SF recounted awakening in the middle of the night to find David inappropriately touching her. Frightened by this disturbing behavior, she shifted her position and prompted David to hastily exit the room. Shockingly, this inappropriate touching occurred again the following night. In the morning when the girls awoke, SF decided to confide in David's daughter about her father's unsettling actions. To her astonishment, the daughter responded with something along the lines of, he does that sometimes. Over time, SF mustered the courage to share this distressing experience with her parents. Shortly after Gretchen's disappearance, the Zanstra family relocated to Plano, Texas, a suburb of Dallas, in response to the situation. During her interview, SF also shared with state police information about another child in their neighborhood, a girl named Holly, whom she considered a friend. According to her, someone had made an attempt to abduct Holly. As the conversation unfolded, SF presented the investigators with a diary she had kept during her childhood. In a specific diary entry dated September 15, 1975, she had written that a man had tried to kidnap Holly twice. In the diary, she went on to express her suspicion that this man, whom she referred to as Mr. Z, might be the one responsible for Gretchen's kidnapping. Mr. Z was her way of referring to David. This revelation from SF added a significant layer to the investigation into Gretchen's disappearance and murder. The interview with SF and her diary entry 
motivated investigators to locate 83-year-old David, who was now residing in Marietta, situated northwest of Atlanta, Georgia. On July 17, 2023, investigators conducted an interview with David at the Cobb County Police Headquarters in Marietta. This interview was carried out by two Pennsylvania troopers, Andrew Martin and Eugene Trey. The conversation started with a somewhat friendly tone. In the beginning, David initially denied having encountered Gretchen on the day she disappeared. However, the situation took a different turn when the police informed David about the allegations of assault made by a woman who had documented her experiences in the diary. As the conversation progressed, David eventually broke down and confessed to something profoundly disturbing. David recounted to the police that he had observed Gretchen walking towards the church that morning. He claimed that he offered her a ride in his green AMC Rambler station wagon, and she accepted as she had no reason to decline the offer. However, contrary to taking her to church as promised, David admitted to investigators that he drove Gretchen to a nearby wooded area. There he parked the car and instructed Gretchen to undress, but she refused. Following this, he struck Gretchen with his fist, resulting in her suffering head injuries and bleeding. David then admitted that, hearing Gretchen was dead, he tried to conceal her partially unclothed body with sticks before leaving the area. This shocking revelation left detectives stunned as they processed the horrifying details of what David had confessed to. In the wake of this shocking revelation, David was arrested and faced a slew of serious charges, including criminal homicide and first-degree murder as a result of his confession regarding Gretchen. But the big story on Action News tonight is the arrest announced today in the decades-old murder of an eight-year-old girl in Delaware County. David Bantra, his Ladies and gentlemen, a monster. He is every parent's worst nightmare. And tonight, David Zanstra, now 83 years old, is finally behind bars. Prosecutors say he abducted and brutally killed Gretchen Harrington back in 1975 as that little girl walked to the Bible camp where he was a pastor. While David's confession provided some closure concerning Gretchen's fate, it also raised a disconcerting question with ramifications that reached far and wide. Could this man, who had openly admitted to killing one girl and harming others, have additional victims. Before relocating to Marple, David had served as a pastor at a now-closed church in Flanders, New Jersey, for several years. During his time at Trinity, he had been an outspoken advocate against the inclusion of education about sexuality in the local school district's curriculum. Less than a year after the discovery of Gretchen's remains, he moved his family to a church in Plano, Texas, just outside Dallas, where he led the congregation for seven years. Following this, David's pastoral journey took him to the Living Faith Community Church in San Diego. His final pastoral assignment was in Fairfield, California, from which he retired in 2005 at the age of 65. Authorities were aware that this lengthy period of leadership provided him with considerable influence and access to young and vulnerable individuals. This left them with questions about the potential extent of his actions during these years. The Marple community had at long last received some of the answers it sought for decades, but the shocking turn of events did not bring peace to many residents. It had been far more comforting to believe that an outsider, a disturbed criminal had committed this heinous act, a person who randomly entered the town, abducted a young girl, and then vanished as swiftly as they arrived. However, the perpetrator was not an outsider, but rather a respected member of their own community. It was a religious leader, a man with a wife and young daughters of his own. This further shattered the sense of security within the community. In the aftermath of all this, Gretchen's family issued a statement. In it, they expressed their gratitude to law enforcement officials for their ongoing dedication to the case. They also conveyed their hope that the individual responsible for Gretchen's tragic murder would be held accountable. Following David's arrest, his legal team initially contested an extradition process. However, prosecutors led by Delaware County District Attorney Jack Stolsteimer sought assistance from Governor Josh Shapiro's office to facilitate the return of the confessed perpetrator to Pennsylvania. David is presently under investigation for potential instances of abuse beyond this case. Additionally, investigators took a DNA sample from David, which could prove valuable in a broader context, aiding in the investigation of other missing persons. 
as well as cases involving assault and murder nationwide. As we conclude this harrowing case, one can't help but reflect on the complexities and twists that unfolded over the years. What challenges lie ahead of Gretchen's family as they seek closure and healing after all these years? And what about David, the perpetrator? What kind of justice do you think he should face for his actions? And how will his arrest impact other potential cases of abuse? If you have any comments or would like to suggest other cases you would like us to cover, please feel free to share your thoughts below. On the quiet autumn night of October 31st, 1991, in Tyler, Texas, as the fall season settled in, the clock struck 2 a.m. The peaceful neighborhood of 29th Street was deep in slumber, except for a small framed house nestled at the corner, unaware that it was about to become a scene of horror. Eight-year-old Chad Choice lay in his bed, lost in dreams, when an intruder silently invaded the house, snatching him away into the darkness of the night. Initially deemed a runaway incident due to lack of evidence, the case transformed into a nightmare for investigators once the crucial 48-hour window passed without any sign of Chad. Who might have had the means to silently infiltrate Chad's home, spiriting him away without a trace? But the pivotal question remains, would Chad ever reunite with his family and return home? The city Tyler, named after the 10th President of the United States, John Tyler, stands as the largest in northeastern Texas. Often referred to as the Rose Capital or Rose City, Tyler earned its reputation due to its extensive history of rose production, cultivation, and processing. Each October, the city welcomes thousands of tourists. However, the October of 1991 took a dark turn as Chad Choice mysteriously vanished without a trace, casting a shadow over the usually vibrant atmosphere. Ernest Chadwick Choice, known affectionately as Chad Choice, came into the world on April 26, 1983, in Texas. He was one of the cherished four children in the Choice household, a beautiful soul deeply adored by his family, particularly his mother, Karen Elaine Choice. Chad was an outgoing youngster, surrounded by a large circle of friends with whom he frequently played. Moreover, his strong bond and affectionate relationship with his siblings were apparent, as they often enjoyed quality time together. Chad's energetic and lively nature was further evident in his regular visits to the playground. Chad had an older sister named Angela Choice, who fondly recalls that her little brother had a passion for riding bikes, scaling trees, and indulging in sports. Details about the remaining siblings were not made public. As a student at Mommy G. Griffin Elementary School, Chad's life was in its budding stage. At just eight years old, he had his entire future ahead of him. However, fate often takes unforeseen turns and tragically Chad's destiny had already been sealed. The daily routine of the Choice family was shattered on the morning of October 31st, 1991. It was uh, my birthday that day, and I was getting ready uh, for church, coffee and uh, reading, as I always did, and I decided not to wake the children. On the fateful morning, Chad's mother, Karen, rose early and went to the church without waking her children allowing them to continue sleeping. However, just a few minutes into her church service, Karen received a phone call. It was my daughter, and she asked me if Chad was with me. And I said, no, I left him at home. And she said, well, we've looked everywhere and we can't find him. Karen rushed back home and began scouring the neighborhood for Chad. She sought assistance from her neighbors as well. Despite their collective efforts and their thorough search, Chad seemed to have vanished without a trace. It was as though he had disappeared into thin air. We were just looking up to see if he was just playing a joke on us, and we were walking around the house looking up in the trees to see if he was there. But all in the same time, there was just something that just kept... I just had this feeling something was wrong. Now it was the police's turn to investigate the matter. Karen dialed 711, reaching the Tyler Police Station, where Sergeant Bill Goking responded and arrived at their house shortly after the call. During his initial inspection, he looked for signs of a break-in, but there were no indication of forced entry. Moreover, there were no signs of struggle inside the house. The first thing he notices, no pry marks on the door. Based on the initial investigation, Gokin began to consider the possibility that Chad might have run away from home. We didn't see anything like a forced entry, any blood trails, any signs of uh, um, ransacking, things that would be indicative of a crime scene. 
However, Karen firmly believed that her son had been kidnapped, and as the sun set and the day turned into a chilly night, her tension escalated into fear. Fear starts to set in, and um, you're wondering what is going on, who is he with? Because I knew um, it was it's dark now, and I, he's, he's ready to come home. Adding to her fear, the crucial 48-hour window had passed without any signs of him kind of a rule of thumb and it's not like this in every case but uh, if you're not on the road towards resolving something in 48 hours it's it's going to be difficult to resolve later during the interview chad's older sister angela choice provided a crucial piece of information to the detective her house keys had disappeared the day before and she distinctly recalled leaving them by the back door of the residence this revelation raised additional questions suggesting the possibility of a planned kidnapping or something even more disturbing Two days after Chad's disappearance, a ransom note was discovered at the business of Chad's uncle, Greg Sterling. By this time, our, uh, our hopes that Chad was alive were, were slim. We, we really didn't have any idea in our own minds that he would still be alive. So another demand would seem very strange. Prompting the investigation to swiftly shift focus to a kidnapping scenario. As the family attempted to deliver the money at the Greyhound bus station, as instructed, the kidnapper failed to appear. There was this renewal for a brief moment, and then we sat there and we waited and waited and waited. And waited. They didn't come through. Several days later, Chad's mother received an anonymous phone call revealing that Chad's disappearance was leaked to a family member's drug debt with a man named Paco. Investigators discovered that Greg Sterling owed money to three Colombian drug dealers in the area, Paco Jr. and Carlos, shedding light on a possible motive of Chad's abduction. However, the case still remained elusive. On the one-year anniversary of Chad's disappearance, his mother Karen Choice discovered a note fluttering on her car windshield. The note asserted that Chad was still alive and demanded $6,000 for his safe return. This development reignited the investigation, filling the Choice family with hope and prayers of seeing Chad again. However, the case suffered a setback when the kidnapper failed to make contact once more, causing the investigation to stall again. Time was not on their side. Slowly years were passing by, and Chad Choice's disappearance gradually evolved into a cold case. Four years later, in October 1995, a grocery sack appeared on the Chase family's doorstep. Initially, it seemed like a regular grocery sack. However, upon opening, it revealed something that would haunt Karen Choice for the rest of her life. Inside the package was a human skull. There was this part of me that was saying, this may be, but I'm saying no. No, this, this is not Chad. Chad is still alive. The skull was subsequently sent to the FBI for analysis. DNA samples from Choice's family were collected to compare with the skull's DNA to confirm its identity as Chad's. Despite these efforts, the results remained inconclusive. Later, the skull was sent to a university in Texas for further examination, involving the expertise of forensic anthropology. Sometimes, and particularly in the case of children, when there is not much of a medical or dental record, we might resort to other techniques. Uh, for example, uh, if we think we know who the uh, remains represent, we might ask for photographs of the individual and we might attempt to do some sort of comparison between the skeletal remains and a photograph. The results came back, and unfortunately Karen's worst fears were confirmed when forensic analysis revealed that the skull indeed belonged to Chad. Investigators grappled with the ruthless nature of a person who not only commits a crime, but continues to torment the victim's family for years. Despite the struggle to comprehend this, Karen, all along, had an unshakable feeling in her heart that she would never see Chad alive again. All she could do now was pray for justice. This demonic to do something like this and then to place it on the family's doorstep. Who is this person? And I mean, I think that uh, there was an anger that rose up in me that I had never felt before. I had to see who this person was. While Chad Choice's case grew increasingly difficult to solve, Another narrative unfolded in Smith County Jail in early 1996. A man named Patrick Horn was slated to be sentenced in federal court for credit union robberies and carjacking charges. 
He was also charged with the murder of J.C. Levasseur, a fruit stand owner. Same credit union gets robbed. Uh, again, it's the same thing. Two men come in uh, with their faces covered up, uh, carrying weapons, uh, immediately rush the tellers, uh, catching them off guard, and demand money. Uh, it was our belief that probably the same two people were responsible for it. It happened in the same manner. Uh, two black males walked in, masked. It became evident that he was destined to spend the rest of his life behind bars or even face a potential death sentence. However, this man we are discussing was soon to become the center of Chad's murder case. It occurred when he mentioned the name Chad Choice to the police during his time behind the bars. While this might have been a part of a deal to reduce his prison sentence, to the investigators, it marked the first significant breakthrough they had made in the case so far. Horn was a resident in the Choice family's neighborhood and was friends with them. During his interview regarding Chad's case, Horn informed investigators that he knew the identity of Chad's killer. As per Horn's account, Chad was murdered by two local drug dealers, both Colombian nationals, who were known by the street names Paco and Carlos but the case was just about to get more twisted. After Horn made the statement, he received a package in his jail cell containing a small boy's leg bone, later confirmed through analysis to be Chad's. The jailers intercept this package that was sent to, to Pat Horn, uh, and they find what appears to be a leg bone and also a note threatening him that if he gives any information about Chad Choice that, that they'll kill him or kill his family. Horn asserted to the police that Paco and Carlos had sent the package. However, detectives couldn't shake the feeling that Horn was hiding something significant about the entire story. Despite repeated questioning by the detectives, Horn consistently maintained that he had no additional information apart from Paco and Carlos being the culprits. However, on May 31st, 1996, Horn finally disclosed something more. He told us that uh, he had helped uh, that he had dug a hole, dug a grave for Chad at the uh, direction of Paco and Carlos. He tells us, he says, see, you know, basically I'm a victim in this, in this crime as well. All I did was help bury the child, uh, didn't have any other involvement in it, and, and now they're threatening me because of my knowledge of what they did. Horn then revealed the precise location where Chad was buried. Shortly afterward, he was escorted by the police to 401 Sunnyside in Tyler, which was Horn's own backyard. I think one thing that, that made us doubt Pat Horn was knowing just how much he was involved with these guys because Pat had a reputation of exaggerating and trying to build up his uh, own self-importance. He really opens the door wide uh, as far as uh, us looking at him uh, as being involved in this, uh, certainly more so than, than he tells us. Some of the agents and officers dug down. They hit uh, a plastic bag and dug a little more and found bones, found clothing. At 4 p.m. that same day, the detectives began digging and discovered Chad's skeletal remains, along with 38 caliber shell casings. This moment marked a sudden turn in the investigation. With the evidence before them, all suspicions now pointed directly at Patrick Horn. Without delay, in June 1996, the investigators hurried to Athens, a city in Texas. In a jail cell there, a man sat who was anticipated to be a crucial piece of the puzzle, important in solving the case once and for all. We seized an opportunity when he was in custody in Athens and uh, really conducted a, a, a hard interview with him, and he, he chose to, to come forward. This man was none other than Patrick Horn's brother, Keaton Horn, who was facing charges of probation violation. The detective's suspicions were completely on point this time. With Keaton's statement, this case solidified into concrete evidence that Horn was indeed responsible for this notorious crime. He admitted to uh, digging up the bones or the leg bone and mailing to Pat in jail and uh, at his direction preparing the note uh, to make it look like a threat from Paco and Carlos. What Keithan did was show us that uh, Paco and Carlos had not reached out to Pat to threaten him, that Pat had reached out to himself basically to make it look like he was being threatened, which 
uh, was a very, very important, uh, you know, break in the case. Horn's scheme to mislead investigators had ultimately unraveled. The solution to a seemingly unsolvable case was finally in hand. However, one question still lingered. Why did Horn kill Chad? Pat's ambition was to be a, a gangster, to, to be a crook. And Pat is one of those people that, that I believe that if, if he's not recognized by someone else, he's going to make sure that someone recognizes what he did. I mean, it's a sixth sense of what he did. On September 24th, 1999, eight years after Chad Choice's murder, the jury found Horn guilty in the Smith County Courthouse and sentenced him to death. However, even at the end of his chapter, Horn wouldn't cease tormenting the Choice household. Horn adamantly refused to sign the waiver allowing Chad's remains to be released to his family for a proper burial. Legally, he was required to agree to the release since the remains were evidence in his case. However, he insisted on retaining control over the fate of the eight-year-old Chad's remains. Horn did initially sign a waiver, indicating his agreement to the release of Chad Choice's remains. However, the document was somehow lost between his attorney's office and the judge's office. At first deemed a mere formality, District Judge Diane DiVasato announced in a December 1999 hearing that she would order the release of 30 exhibits, including Chad's skull and other bones, to his family for burial, contingent upon Horn signing another waiver. Horn's appellate lawyer, Tony Wilkinson of Greenville, sent the document to Horn via Federal Express, anticipating its return with a signature within a day. However, a month passed without any response from Horn. He did not reply to several letters from his attorney and ignored messages sent to him through officials at the Atlanta Federal Prison. Assistant District Attorney Ed Marty stated that if the remains were granted without the waiver, they might have to be exhumed sometime in the future. It remains uncertain when Horn eventually signed the waiver, and if he did, when he signed I it. I treated you like you were my son. Always welcome in my house. Fed you. Prayed for you. What about Chad? You want to see a picture to remind you? Don't you want to see his picture? I need to know that. What about Chad's life? Nobody gave him that choice. You know, you talk like you're some sort of f***ing badass. God damn it, you put your own ass there when you took her boy. You shouldn't have took her f***ing boy. Damn it. Don't f***ing nobody. Furthermore, Horn was 17 years old when he committed the murder of Chad. According to a ruling by the United States Supreme Court, anyone under the age of 18 cannot be executed. As a result, his sentence was commuted to life in prison. While this might not have been the exact form of justice Karen Choice desired, she can finally find solace in knowing that Patrick Horn will never walk free. As the final chapter in the Chad Joyce case concludes, there remains a haunting mystery that continues to trouble both investigators and Chad's grieving family. Why did Patrick Horn go to such lengths, kidnapping Chad Joyce, refusing the ransom, and ultimately taking his life? What could have motivated such a horrifying act? And do you believe the mother who lost her beloved child will ever find peace again? Let us know your thoughts. We're eager to hear from you. If you have any suggestions for a case you'd like us to cover, please mention it in the comments section. At 4.45 p.m. on January 24, 1991, in East Harlem, New York, 13-year-old Paola Alira returned home from school. Her mother buzzed her in as she entered her apartment building's elevator and headed for her family's 30th floor unit. However, she mysteriously vanished during that short journey. Three hours later, around 7.30 p.m., a man out on a walk with his dog discovered Paola's lifeless body half a mile away from her home.
As the sun set on that tragic day, the neighborhood was left with haunting questions. What happened to Paola, and who could be behind her disappearance and death? Paola and her family were part of the community of East Harlem, also known as El Barrio, located in the heart of Manhattan, New York City. This culturally rich enclave is renowned for its dynamic mix of traditions, art, and community spirit. East Harlem boasts a diverse population with a strong Hispanic and Latino heritage. Evidenced by its lively festivals, eateries, and colorful murals that adorn its streets. The neighborhood is home to the famous Museum of the City of New York, showcasing the city's history. According to statistics, your chance of being a victim of crime in East Harlem is about 1 in 22. And it is here our story began. Paola Alera was born in Colombia in the late 1970s to her parents, Caesar and Olga Alera. She had two older siblings, Julio and Alexandra. In June of 1990, Paola, along with her mother and two siblings, moved to East Harlem, New York City, in hopes of finding a better life. They lived on the 30th floor of an apartment building at 420 East 111th Street, where they stayed with Paola's uncle, Guillermo Ospina. Her father, Caesar, remained in Colombia, working as a taxi driver, and was saving money to eventually join them in New York. Upon their arrival in New York, Paola started attending junior high school 99. According to her sister, Alexandra, Paola excelled academically, focusing her spare time on studying English and mathematics. She had only a handful of friends, mostly classmates, and aspired to become a lawyer to help those in need. Her uncle Guillermo described her as highly intelligent and mature for her age, thinking beyond her years. He also noted that Paola was very happy in New York because of her love for the English language. She was a young girl with many plans for the future, her uncle Guillermo said. Everything appeared to be going smoothly for Paola and her family until a heartbreaking event suddenly changed their lives. On the cold afternoon of January 24, 1991, Paola, who was just 13 years old at the time, left her school and made her way back to the familiar surroundings of her apartment building. At approximately 4.45 p.m., she arrived at the entrance of the building and used the intercom to call her apartment. Her mother, Olga, answered and let her in by pressing the button to unlock the lobby door. This ordinary interaction would be the final one Olga would share with her beloved daughter. With the door now open, Paola entered the lobby and stepped into an elevator, but tragically, she never made it to their 30th floor apartment. Ten minutes later, when Paola hadn't arrived home, her brother and uncle grew worried. They felt that something was amiss and decided to go look for her. As they hurried down to the lobby, they found it completely empty. They began searching the neighborhood desperately for Paola, but it was as if she had vanished into thin air. Three hours later, around 7.30 p.m., a man out for a walk with his dog made a chilling discovery. He spotted a lifeless figure lying on a walkway near the East River. The area was littered with drug-related items like vials, syringes, and used lighters. Tragically, what he found was Paola's slender body and she had passed away. The site where she was found was located about a half a mile to the south of the apartment building where she lived. When detectives arrived at the scene, they were faced with a deeply saddening sight. There was a stab wound in the center of her chest, and uh, further examination revealed that she had a ligature around her neck, and there was hardly any blood coming from the stab wound. There were no clues to indicate who might have committed this crime. The only things they discovered on Paola's body were a new kids on the block watch on her wrist and a piece of chalk in her pocket. Paola's murder profoundly affected not only her family, but also the entire neighborhood. Her mother, Olga, was inconsolable, struggling to come to terms with the loss of her daughter. At Paola's school, both students and teachers were in shock. In the aftermath of this tragedy, teachers held meetings with students to provide support for those who were close to Paola, helping them cope with their grief. They also advised all students not to walk alone in the area for safety reasons. In response to the incident, reporters were not allowed to access the school, 
and the principal and district officials declined to speak with them. Detectives were left with numerous unanswered questions. They went from door to door in the 32-floor building, hoping to find witnesses who might have seen Paola in the area where her body was eventually discovered. Unfortunately, they couldn't locate anyone who had seen her there. Moreover, the detectives had no information about the appearance of the person responsible for this tragedy. It remained uncertain whether Paola was killed in the isolated spot filled with crack vials where her body was found or somewhere else. Through their investigation, the detectives managed to piece together some important details. They discovered that Paola regularly stayed at school after hours for a journalism workshop on Wednesdays and Thursdays. On the day of her tragic murder, she had been working on an article about her father, intending to send it to him as a Valentine's Day gift. The detectives also found out that on that fateful day, Paola left the school after the workshop at around 4 p.m. and walked north along First Avenue with a friend. They parted ways at 106th Street with Paola continuing to her family's apartment building. During their inquiries, the detective learned that another teenager named Aaron Wofford had entered the same elevator as Paola. However, when they spoke with him, he claimed to have gotten off at the 19th floor while Paola continued upward. As a result, the detectives shifted their focus away from him as a suspect. The autopsy revealed the full extent of the terrible ordeal Paola had endured. She had been violated, strangled, and stabbed three times near her heart. The medical examiner also noticed unusual elongated marks on her thighs. It was clear that Paola had bravely resisted an assault, and her attacker had forcefully separated her legs, causing bruises on their thighs that matched the shape of their fingers. The examiner also collected male hair from her body. This was stored as evidence. On February 2, 1991, Paola's body was laid to rest at St. Michael's Cemetery in East Elmhurst, Queens. Four months later, after her tragic murder, Paola's family decided to relocate to Flushing, New York, and they received support from Victim Services, a private nonprofit organization that assists victims of violent crimes and their families. In Flushing, Olga sought solace through counseling at the Families of Homicide Victims Program also run by Victims Services. As the family continued to cope and heal, they held on to the hope of achieving justice for Paola. However, as this time passed, Paola's case gradually grew colder, and the quest for answers became increasingly challenging. The murder of a 13-year-old girl should have been a major news story in any city at any time. However, in the violence-ridden New York of 1991, this dreadful crime in East Harlem was largely unnoticed. Between 1990 and 1992, the city reported over 2,000 murders each year, with an average of six bodies discovered daily across the five boroughs of New York City. Unfortunately, most of these occurred in impoverished, predominantly minority neighborhoods, such as East Harlem, the South Bronx, and East New York, Brooklyn. Regrettably, very few of these cases received significant attention from the media. Instead, the media often focused on more upscale crimes involving white, wealthy victims in picturesque locations. Without the pressure from the media or politicians, Paolo's case became a low-priority homicide. Consequently, her murder remained unsolved and largely forgotten throughout much of the 1990s. By the mid-1990s, crime rates in New York City were on the decline. However, in the housing projects of East Harlem, a disturbing trend persisted. A series of seemingly unrelated incidents began to occur, all involving the assault and murder of young, attractive teenagers with large skin, regardless of whether they were black or Hispanic. In 1994, a 15-year-old girl became a victim when she was confronted by an attacker brandishing a knife. This case revealed a consistent pattern used by the assailant, which he would repeat multiple times over the next four years. He would approach the teenager from behind and guide her to an isolated location. There he would blindfold her using a piece of her own clothing 
coerce her to undress, and then subject her to assault. Remarkably, the 15-year-old survivor was able to provide a description of her attacker. He was a well-groomed young man with a muscular build, and he displayed an excessive sense of self-importance. Shockingly, he even told the victim that she should consider herself fortunate to be assaulted by someone as good-looking as himself. A few years later, on September 10, 1997, Firefighters responded to a rooftop fire at the George Washington houses on East 104th Street. A response from a Bronx precinct who had a missing person report of a young woman by the name of Joe Hollis Castro. In the aftermath, they discovered the lifeless body of a woman who had suffered severe abuse, had been struck with a blunt object, and was burnt so badly that she was unrecognizable. This victim was later identified as 19-year-old Jahias Castro, who had moved to New York from the Dominican Republic with her family. Jahias, a young mother with a daughter, had been pursuing her studies in computer science at a community college in the Bronx. Seven months later, in April 1998, a 13-year-old girl was the next victim in the same neighborhood. Thankfully, this young victim managed to escape with her life. Two months after that, on June 2, 1998, 17-year-old Rashida Washington met a tragic end. She was found in a 15th-floor stairwell of an East 112th Street housing project, having been robbed, assaulted, and strangled. Uh, at the time we found her, we weren't sure exactly what had happened to her. Uh, we got the job as an investigated DOA. She was nude underneath the shirt that was covering her covering her almost like a shroud, it was like it was placed over her face and upper body, but she was nude underneath, no bra, no shirt. Her lifeless body, with its naked torso covered by a shirt, had been positioned in a seated stance against the wall. Similar to the earlier victims, Rashida, a fashion student who worked at a clothing boutique, was petite, weighing only 100 pounds. Tragically, she was murdered just three days after celebrating her 18th birthday. In that same year, during the fall, two more young teenagers fell victim to assaults in the same area. A 15-year-old was attacked on September 25, 1998, followed by a 14-year-old on November 16. Thankfully, these two adolescents survived, likely because they didn't get a good look at the attacker before being blindfolded. Interviewed her boyfriend. Um, we interviewed a lot of people, but there was no, nobody that was really sticking out as a, as a viable suspect. Even as these similar cases continued to accumulate, the police did not publicly acknowledge the possibility of a serial murderer targeting teenage girls in East Harlem. However, due to the concerns raised by the parents of the victims, the police eventually decided to take prompt action. In the 1990s, there was a relatively small database of DNA samples on record because of widespread testing of convicted felons had not yet begun. However, a significant breakthrough had occurred in the autumn of 1998 concerning the East Harlem cases. New York police experts in forensics compared bodily fluid evidence from the Rashida Washington murder with evidence from two other similar cases in the neighborhood. These tests conclusively link the same perpetrator to all three crimes. From rape victim one was originally believed to be part of a different pattern. And um, as it turned out, that case was not part of that rape pattern, but had created a new pattern with homicide victim Rashida Washington and this rape case. Finally, detectives had solid evidence confirming the existence of a serial criminal preying on teenagers in Harlem. In response, Police leadership assembled a specialized task force comprising detectives with the sole mission of apprehending the suspect. The police took action by distributing a wanted poster that included a sketch of the serial attacker. This sketch was based on descriptions provided by the victims. Shortly after posting the flyer in East Harlem, a tipster who called in suggested that the detectives should closely investigate a 25 year old man known as Ace who resided on the 19th floor of the same building where Paola had lived. The police quickly identified Ace's real name as Aran Key, and this name triggered a memory. The name Aran 
had initially surfaced during Paola's murder investigation. Detectives recalled the teenager, named Aran Wofford, who had been seen entering the elevator at the same time as Paola and had claimed to have exited on the 19th floor. The distinctive first name, Aran, had also reappeared in the investigation of Johais Castro's murder in 1997. They pull phone records and find a series of calls from Johalis's home in the Bronx to a Cynthia Key in Manhattan's East Harlem neighborhood. I spoke to Ms. Key on the phone. I called up, identified myself. I asked her if, you know, she knew this, you know, this person. She said no. She says, but I have a son who, you know, is about that age. Maybe he might know her. So I asked her what her son's name was, and she told me his name was uh, Aaron Malik Key. And she said he wasn't home at the time. So I left her my name and number, and I said, do me a favor, when, when he comes in, have him call me. Phone records showed that in the days leading up to her death, Johias had made numerous calls to a man named Aran Key. When questioned by the police, Aran explained that Johias had been a friend of his girlfriend, Jacqueline. He accounted for his numerous phone calls by stating that the two women had been planning a shopping trip on the day of Johias' murder. The police also interviewed Jacqueline, who confirmed Aran's explanation. It was only later that the police realized that Aran Wofford and Aran Key were actually the same person. Wofford was his father's last name, and Key was his mother's. This revelation connected Aran Key to two out of the three victims in the suspected serial killer case. He was the last person known to have seen Paola alive and there was a significant history of phone communication between him and Johias in the days leading up to her death. These connections could not only have been coincidence. Detectives decided to dig deeper into Aran's background. They found that he was an intelligent and reasonably well-spoken individual. He was born on September 18, 1973, and he had spent most of his childhood in East Harlem. During the time of Paola's disappearance in 1991, he was living with relatives in the same building as her. Aran was known as a charming person with a knack for computers. He claimed to be involved in rap music production, although there was little evidence to support this claim. Physically, he stood just 5 feet 8 inches, and he was fairly handsome. His criminal record showed only one arrest for robbery in 1990, and he had spent little or no time behind bars. However, neighbors had a different perspective on Aran. They described him as having a troubling side. He had a habit of peering through the peepholes of women in his building, and he often wandered around with a portable video camera, attempting to capture inappropriate footage. At this stage, the police didn't have much substantial evidence against Iran, but they understood the importance of a thorough investigation. They focused on the assailant involved in the September 1998 incident, who had left behind a black fubu cap and a gray sweatshirt. The detectives decided to look closer into these clothing items for leads. Their efforts paid off when they found a laundry tag on one of the garments. This tag eventually led the police to a dry cleaner located near Aran's building. What made this discovery even more significant was that the client list at this dry cleaner included Aran's mother, Cynthia. Every piece of information seemed to point to Aran as a prime suspect and law enforcement was increasingly convinced that testing his DNA would confirm his involvement in the crimes. However, there was a significant hurdle. Iran had no DNA on record because mandatory DNA testing for accused felons in New York wouldn't begin until the year 2000. In the 1990s, obtaining a DNA sample was not as straightforward as bringing a suspect and asking for a swab. DNA tests were still seen as invasive procedures and acquiring a sample required judicial authorization based on reasonable suspicion. Even though there was substantial circumstantial evidence pointing towards Iran's involvement, detectives were aware that the details like the elevator ride, phone calls, and the laundry tag alone wouldn't be enough to persuade a judge to order Iran to provide a DNA sample. Consequently, the police had to resort to an alternative plan. Their initial approach involved tailing Aran Key, hoping he would unknowingly leave behind a sample of his saliva, like through spitting or disposing of chewing gum. 
However, this tactic quickly proved to be unsuccessful. On February 8, 1999, detectives finally caught a break when Oran was arrested for his involvement in the theft of a computer hard drive. Since there were no laws mandating DNA testing for arrested individuals in New York at that time, the police had to resort to a bit of trickery in an attempt to obtain a DNA sample. They devised a plan where a female detective disguised herself as a doctor. Wearing a white hospital garment, she approached Iran and asked him to provide a saliva sample for what she described as a routine tuberculosis test. She handed him paperwork and hoped he would sign a release form. However, Iran, being cautious, took the time to read the document. When he noticed a line mentioning DNA analysis, he refused to cooperate. He claimed that he was a practicing Jehovah's Witness and that his faith prohibited him from participating in any form of medical treatment. Iran had figured out what the police were after, and he was determined not to give it to them. After finishing his meal that evening, he tore his paper cup into pieces and flushed them down the toilet. To further confuse investigators, he swapped his cup with that of his cellmate. However, the police were one step ahead. Shortly after Iran's arrest, he had been in a shared holding cell with several other men. During their time there, attendants had provided them with cups of water. Detectives managed to locate these cups in a waste paper basket and sent them for DNA testing. Within just a couple of days, the results came back, confirming that a sample collected from the rim of one of the cups found in the police holding cell matched the DNA of the East Harlem criminal. By the time the DNA test results were ready on February 12, 1999, Iran had already been released without bail, as he was only facing a misdemeanor charge related to computer theft. Meanwhile, the New York Police Department offered an $11,000 reward for any information that could lead to his arrest. Authorities soon discovered that Iran had traveled to Brownsville, Brooklyn, and met up with his 16-year-old girlfriend named Angelique Stalling. Her parents believed that they were going on a Valentine's Day date. However, Instead of sticking to their plans, Iran and Angelique boarded a bus headed for Florida from Newark, New Jersey. Detectives grew concerned that Angelique might be in danger, potentially facing the same fate as the previous victims. After Iran arrived in South Florida, he made two phone calls to another girlfriend back in New York. By this time, news of his status as a suspected serial killer on the run had made headlines. The second girlfriend, aware of the situation, promptly contacted the police and provided a tip that Iran was staying at the Miami Sun Hotel, located just two blocks from the beach on Northeast First Avenue in downtown Miami. Responding to this tip, two New York detectives rushed to the hotel and began surveilling it. When they spotted Iran and Angelique walking around inside, they called a Miami-Dade SWAT team for assistance. The SWAT team stormed the building and discovered Iran and Angelique hiding under the bed on the hotel's sixth floor. And on February 19, 1999, Iran was apprehended and placed in custody. When detectives attempted to interrogate Iran about the East Harlem crimes, he remained silent and didn't provide any information. However, the police had a plan. They later observed and listened from behind a two-way mirror as they allowed Angelique into the interview room. Iran and Angelique believed they were having a private moment to say their goodbyes. During this conversation, Angelique pressed Iran to explain why he had committed the crimes. Iran's response was cryptic. He mentioned that he had bugged out and claimed to have had a sickness. After a lengthy four-month legal battle, Iran was eventually extradited to New York to face trial on 22 felony charges related to four assaults and the murders of Paola Ilera, Johias Castro, and Rashida Washington. DNA evidence connected Iran to six out of the seven cases. During the trial in the fall of 2000, prosecutors John Irwin and Richard Plansky presented a powerful case. With a barrage of testimonies and DNA evidence against Iran, they called upon 130 prosecution witnesses, including two of Iran's victims. Iran himself insisted on being the first defense witness to take the stand. Over the course of two days of testimony, Iran displayed a range of emotions, from giggling like a schoolgirl to crying like a baby. He also expressed his anger at being prosecuted. 
His monologue, which was largely uninterrupted by the judge, prosecutors, or his own attorneys, covered a wide range of topics, including pop culture, drugs, rap music, jail food, and his reflections on the criminal justice system. With many of his victims' family members present in the courtroom, Iran wove a bizarre narrative to explain why he found himself facing charges of brutal serial violence against young women. He asserted that the police had conspired to frame him as a part of a cover-up orchestrated by a corrupt medical examiner who was involved in harvesting and selling human organs. He even claimed that his DNA had been manipulated in what he referred to as genetic shuffling. However, the jury did not buy into his elaborate story. On December 16, 2000, when the guilty verdict was delivered, the courtroom burst into cheers. As Iran was later led past the crowd of grieving relatives, he directed a profane curse at them. During the sentencing a month later, in January 2001, family members of Iran's victims had the opportunity to speak directly to him. Olga Paola's mother addressed him, expressing her wish that he would understand the torment of sleepless nights, loss of appetite, the inability to walk or breathe, and the absence of peace all the while thinking about her daughter's suffering at the time of her death. Olga spoke of her enduring pain, having brought her daughter to the country in pursuit of the American dream. When it was Iran's turn to speak at the sentencing hearing, he began to cry and said that he was sorry. In response to this, a male cousin of Johias Castro erupted in anger and attempted to leap over the barrier in an effort to attack Iran. Following this, Justice Joan Sodolnik delivered the sentence. She imposed three life sentences on Iran, each without the possibility of parole, for the three murders. Additionally, he received a 400-year sentence for four counts of abuse. Iran was incarcerated in the Clinton Correctional Facility, located in Dannemora, New York. By the time Iran was sentenced, lawmakers in New York and many other states had enacted laws requiring DNA testing for individuals arrested in connection with violent crimes. Since then, this testing has been expanded to encompass most felony arrests, spanning both violent and nonviolent offenses. Moreover, certain jurisdictions have initiated DNA testing for individuals arrested for misdemeanors. For Olga, the agony of losing Paola remains as raw as ever. She understands all too clearly that the anguish stemming from the sudden and senseless loss of a loved one doesn't fade with time especially when so many unresolved questions linger. As we conclude this heart-wrenching journey through Paola's tragic story, her memory and that of the other victims lingers in our thoughts. Reflecting on Iran's actions and consequences he faced, we are left with thought-provoking questions. What drives an individual like Iran to commit crimes like this? And how can society identify and address the factors that lead to such behavior? If you have any other comments or would like to suggest other cases you would like us to cover, please feel free to share your thoughts below. We appreciate your feedback and value your engagement. On August 9, 1980, high school sweethearts Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, both 19, disappeared after attending a wedding reception at Concord House, Concord, Wisconsin. Within the next few days, Searchers found some clues about the couple's whereabouts scattered across town in Concord. A pair of pants, Tim's car with his wallet inside, some ropes, and a pair of women's underwear. These clues led to a grisly discovery. Two months later, the bodies of Tim and Kelly were found savagely violated and left to rot in a field. Almost three decades later, advancements in DNA technology, coupled with an unlikely witness, and an investigator's relentless search for truth led to the identification of the perpetrator. A man so unassuming, even his neighbors had no idea he harbored such dark secrets. But who was this man? And why did it take so long to find him? Today's story takes us back to Concord, Wisconsin, a small town in Jefferson County, Wisconsin. With a population just over 2,000, the quiet town has many parks and nature spots, making it an excellent place for people who love the outdoors. So activities like hiking, biking, fishing, and camping are common among the locals. Concord has a violent crime rate about 7%, 
about a third of the U.S. average of 22.7%. In the 1980s, when the main events in today's story occur, Concord was the sort of place where people never locked their doors and neighbors looked out for each other. So, it was just the sort of place where 19-year-old high school sweethearts, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, believed they could get married, settle on a farm, raise their children, and grow old together. In 1980, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew were 19-year-old high school sweethearts engaged to be married. Although Tim lived with his family in Hebron, a small town in Jefferson County, and Kelly lived with her family in Fort Atkinson, also in Jefferson County, the couple first met when attending Fort Atkinson High School. Kelly was a beautiful, kind young woman with a passion for cosmetology. Tim was a strong and hardworking farm boy. They were both loved by their friends and family for their kind-hearted natures, but as a couple, Tim and Kelly were seen as people for other youngsters to aspire to be like. After high school, Tim started his career as a farmer, and his best friend was a tractor nicknamed The Lonesome Loser. Meanwhile, Kelly went to beauty school and had just graduated in 1980, hoping to become a hairstylist and beautician. On August 9, 1980, Tim and Kelly attended a wedding reception at Concord House, Wisconsin. The couple had plans to meet some friends and go to a carnival after the reception, but they never showed up. The last time anyone saw them alive was around 11 p.m. on August 9, 1980, when they left the reception. By the morning of the following day, August 10, 1980, when they still hadn't been seen or heard from, Tim's father, David Hack, filed missing person reports for both of them. That same day, David found Tim's brown Oldsmobile in the Concord House's parking lot. Locked inside the car was Tim's wallet containing $67, his jacket, and his checkbook. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. There was some talk, I remember. Uh, did they elope? Did they take a bus someplace? On August 15th, searchers found Kelly's pants and underwear by the roadside, about three miles from Concord House, with male bodily fluids on them. They also found some ropes by the roadside that had been knotted by someone who appeared to have military experience. Over the course of 10 days, multiple pieces of clothing belonging to Kelly are found along the roadway within a six mile radius of the Concord House, as well as about a dozen pieces of rope with various knots tied in it. We have very good evidence now. The discovery of these articles of clothing shifted the case drastically. Suddenly, it was no longer a matter of finding a couple who might have just decided to take off and have a romantic getaway. It was now a matter of trying to find them alive because they were likely in danger. About two months later, some squirrel hunters from Milwaukee were out in the Izonia, Wisconsin area, about seven miles from the Concord House. While walking through a wooded area along a railroad track, parallel to Highway 16, east of Watertown. They found the badly decomposed remains of Kelly Drew. She was completely naked. About 100 yards away, they found a fully clothed male body that was identified as the body of Tim Hack. The case, now officially a homicide, was dubbed the Sweetheart Murders. The manner of death for both of them was homicide. I had the radio on, and they announced over the radio that they had indeed found both bodies. And um, so I'm going to tear up. So I remember walking in the kitchen and the detective is there with my parents, telling them that they did indeed find Tim and Kelly. The cause of death was not immediately apparent because investigators found no murder weapon at the scene. However, upon examination, the medical examiner found stab wounds on Tim's body and ligature marks on Kelly, suggesting death by stabbing and strangulation. There were ligature marks on Kelly's ankles and wrists that were consistent with having been bound. Kelly was most possibly strangled based on damage and insect activity around the throat area. The bodily fluids found on Kelly's clothes also suggested assault. The sweetheart murders had all the elements of a sensational story, so it started making headlines across the country. Two teenage sweethearts appeared to have been murdered in a senseless act of violence, and police could not identify the killer or killers. Their investigation began while interviewing everyone who knew the couple to find out if anyone might have hated them enough to kill them. Police also interviewed everyone who attended the wedding reception, including the Concord House staff who worked there that night. One of the question workers was Edward Wayne Edwards, a handyman working at the Concord House. Edward, who lived in a campground adjacent to the Concord House near Interstate 94,
claimed that he had not seen the couple and that he was not even at the Concord house around the time the couple went missing. He claimed that he was deer hunting in the nearby woods. However, police noticed that he had a broken nose. When they asked him about it, he claimed he had gotten it during his deer hunting trip. It seemed weird to the investigators because this was August and deer hunting season in Wisconsin was around November. After the police questioned him, Edward moved his wife and his five children away from Wisconsin in September 1980. Meanwhile, the most promising lead investigators had were eyewitness accounts of a dirty-looking van that had been parked next to Tim's car in the Concord House parking lot. Witnesses claimed that they noticed the van suddenly driving away suspiciously around the time Tim and Kelly were last seen. Edward had a van that fit that description, where he often kept a 357 revolver. But without a plate number or strong evidence connecting him to the crime scene, police could do very little to follow up on that lead. And like that, all other leads in the investigation dried up. The case file was shelled and the case went cold. In 2028, 20 years after the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, Richard Lewell from the Wisconsin Department of Justice, one of the investigators in charge of the original investigation, asked for the case to be reopened. For almost 30 years, Lewell had been unable to let go of the case. For almost 30 years, Lewell had been unable to let go of the case. And now that he was close to retirement, he wanted to do everything in his power to close the case. In an interview, he said, as I was reaching my retirement age, DNA was making drastic leaps and bounds. He felt more confident pursuing the case now because of technological and scientific advancements of the last couple of decades. His newfound confidence was reflected in how he approached the case with vigor. Luell had a hunch that the police had already interviewed the killer in the earlier stages of the investigation and that the person's name would be on file. He just had to find it. After two months of digging through the files, witness statements, and interview recordings, one name stood out to Luell, Edward Wayne Edwards. Not only did Edward have the opportunity and means to commit the crimes, but the fact that he moved his entire family out of Wisconsin shortly after police interviewed him raised red flags. Luell and a team of cold case investigators decide to follow up on his hunch that Edward was the potential killer. When they interviewed Edward's neighbors from when he lived in Concord, Wisconsin, they learned that Edward had been a very difficult person to live with. He was short-tempered and volatile, a restless man who often beat his wife and children on a whim. They said he was basically a monster. His son, John Edwards, who was now 37 years old in 2008, described him as a troubled man, saying, I don't think he knew how to control his emotions. There was some type of rage there. In 2009, April Balasio, Edward's daughter contacted authorities with disturbing information. She said she knew some things about the cold case murder of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew that she believed could help investigators close the case. However, this information that she had implicated one of the men closest to her life, her father, Edward Wayne Edwards, a former Marine with a long history of crime. April was a curious child growing up, and her father's unusual life was the most fascinating puzzle to her. Throughout her life, she had questions about how her father lived and why the family had to move around so often. One day, when she was now an adult, she came across the news article about the unsolved murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, and she remembered that they had moved from Concord, Wisconsin around that time. The puzzle was finally falling into place, and she just knew she had to contact authorities. Edward Wayne Edwards was born in Akron, Ohio in 1933. He lost his parents at a young age and had to live in an orphanage run by nuns. Edward's time at the orphanage was marked with physical and emotional abuse, ultimately shaping him into a restless and rebellious teenager. He had several run-ins with the police for petty crimes like shoplifting and breaking and entering, and by 17, he was serving time at a juvenile detention center. By 1951, when Edward was 18, he was released from juvenile detention on the condition that he joined the U.S. Marines. But after just a few months as a Marine, Edward disappeared and had to be dishonorably discharged. He wasn't ready to leave the life of crime behind, because Edward soon found himself in jail again for robbery. By 1955, when he was 22, he escaped from jail in Akron and traveled across different states robbing gas stations. Edward would spend the rest of his 20s and 30s as a fugitive drifting around the country while doing odd jobs here and there, working as a ship docker, vacuum cleaner retailer, and handyman. From his autobiography, it is easy to tell that Edward enjoyed his notoriety during this period. 
According to him, he never tried to use an alias or disguise his identity while committing his crimes because he wanted to be famous. In 1960, at 27, Edward was once again in prison, this time for attempting to impersonate a federal officer. However, he escaped from the Portland, Oregon jail, where he was being held, prompting the FBI to place him on its 10 most wanted list in 1961. In 1962, authorities caught up with Edward and imprisoned him in the United States Penitentiary, Leavenworth, but he was paroled in 1967 for good behavior. In his memoir, he attributed his growth to the influence of a benevolent guard at Leavenworth. After his parole, Edward got married and became a motivational speaker. In 1972, at age 39, Edward appeared on two television shows to tell the truth and what's my line. That same year, he released his autobiography, The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, The True Life Story of Ed Edwards. He was on numerous talk shows and game shows with this book about his life as a master criminal. In the late 60s, Edwards was on the FBI 10 Most Wanted list. He was a suspect in a double homicide in Portland, Oregon. They couldn't prove that he did it, but upon checking the criminal history of Edward Wayne Edwards, I see that he has been in prison. He has been convicted of numerous crimes to include robbery, uh, vehicle theft, fraud, arson. He's done a lot of, of things. He exhibited all of the classic signs of, the stereotypical signs of a serial killer. He was a bad wetter. He had an affinity for starting fires. He was extremely controlling. It seemed like the stars were finally lining up for Edward. He had beaten the system. He was on his way to success. Unfortunately, Edward's good luck did not last long. In 1977, he committed his first murder. His victims were 21-year-old Billy Lavaco and his girlfriend, 18-year-old Judith Straub, residents of Sterling, Ohio. Billy and Judith went on a date on August 7, 1977, but never returned. Later that day, Judith's car was found in the parking lot of Silver Creek Metro Park, with her shoes and purse still inside. The following day, August 8th, Norton police assisted by family members and a National Guard helicopter launched a search for Billy and Judith. The search party found their bodies in the high weeds near the Metro Park. They had been shot point blank with a 20 gauge shotgun. At the time, investigators could not connect Billy and Judith's case to Edward, so he got away with the murders. These murders also established a pattern that would continue with the murders of Tim and Kelly. Meanwhile, by 1982, when he was 49, Edward was back behind bars in Pennsylvania for arson, but he was still proud of his criminal accomplishments because in 1993, he wrote a letter to the FBI requesting his criminal and history records for cities in 19 states. The records were supposedly for a new book he was writing about criminals he met while in prison such as Tony Provenzano, Charles Manson, and Jimmy Hoffa. In 1996, Edward, 63 years old, committed his third murder. His victim was his foster son, 25-year-old Danny Boy Edwards, who lived with him in Burton, Ohio, for seven years. Before he met his grisly end, Danny Boy was a soldier in the U.S. Army. Edward somehow convinced him to abscond from the Army and return home. When he got home, Edward tricked him into entering the nearby woods and then killed him with two gunshots to the face. Edward left Danny Boy's body in a shallow grave. A hunter eventually found it there and alerted the authorities. But like his first set of murders, Edward also got away with murdering Danny Boy for the next couple of years. People close to Edward, like his son John and his daughter April, described him as a troubled man. He was extremely abusive to his wife and children, resulting in his children moving away from home as soon as possible to escape his abuse. Investigators believed Edward fit the bill for the stereotypical serial killer. He had a long history of crime. He was physically violent with his family members, and the fact that he wrote a book about his crimes showed that he was a narcissist. Edward also had military experience, so he would have known how to tie the knots on the ropes investigators believed were used to strangle Kelly. In addition, Edward's history of arson fits perfectly with the image of someone extremely controlling. By the time he was in his mid-70s, he was overweight and had to move around in a wheelchair, depending on an oxygen tank to breathe. So, his neighbors in Louisville, Kentucky, had no idea that behind his elderly facade lay an evil mind that had done so much damage. However, with new evidence in April's statements, investigators now had a more solid reason to believe Edward might have been involved in the murders. They had to visit him. When investigators got to his home in Louisville and initially began questioning him, 
Edward denied knowing anything about the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. He claimed he hadn't heard anything about them going missing, although he had been questioned about it in 1980. But while investigators doubled down and pressed him more, Edward confessed that he had drank some beers at the Concord house on that fateful night and that he may have seen the couple while he was drinking. He also said, contrary to his earlier statement, he had not been deer hunting that night. After the interview, investigators asked if they could take a swab of his saliva for DNA testing. Edward confidently said they could, believing the DNA test would not reveal anything he did not want investigators to know about. When the state crime lab tested Edward's DNA sample, it matched the DNA found on Kelly's pants. In 2009, Edwards had settled in a trailer park in Louisville, Kentucky. He was pleasant and friendly to his neighbors, and none of them suspected that he had such a dark history. That is until police picked him up and brought him to Wisconsin on July 31, 2009. He was charged with the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. While he was being interviewed, Edward was confronted with the results of the DNA test. Investigators asked him to explain how his bodily fluids came to be on Kelly's clothes. Edward started stuttering, cooking up a story about how he and Kelly had gotten intimate earlier that evening of August 9, 1980, but the act was consensual. He was shifting in his seat, moving his hands every which way. When he sensed the investigators were not buying his performance, he sighed and muttered something under his breath. After replaying the interview recording hundreds of times, I can remember exactly where I was when I when I heard that recording. He thought it was under his breath, or maybe it was subconsciously that he said it. Investigators were confident they had heard what Edward said. Damn it, I killed her. It was as good a confession as any. The gig was up for Edward, and he decided to plead guilty to the murder of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. In April 2010, Edward Wayne Edwards was convicted of the 1980 Sweetheart murders and given two life sentences to run concurrently. Although Edward had asked to be executed, Wisconsin had no death penalty. But according to retired homicide detective Phil Waters, Edward had been in and out of prison. He knows what life is like. He's not a guy that wants to be sitting in a prison ward somewhere and dying a slow death. So hoping to convince the state to give him the death penalty, Edward wrote a letter to the Ohio prosecutor's office, saying you're going to want to put a needle in my arm. In 2010, Edward confessed to the murders of 21-year-old Billy Lavaco and 18-year-old Judith Straub, but it turned out that when he committed the murders in 1977, the death penalty was unconstitutional, so he did not get his wish. Instead, he was given a life sentence for each murder, but he still had one trick up his sleeve. In 2011, during a jailhouse interview, Edward confessed to killing his foster son, 25-year-old Danny Boy Edwards, his motive was the $250,000 life insurance policy he was set to receive upon Danny Boy's death. This time, his plan worked. On March 8, 2011, Edward was sentenced to death for the murder of Danny Boy Edwards. Although he was only convicted of five murders, police speculate that he could have at least nine to 15 more undiscovered victims. In the book titled Peyton Allen Files, the author, Phil Stanford, suggested that Edward might have been responsible for the murders of Beverly Allen and Larry Payton, which took place in Portland, Oregon in 1960. In March 2017, Detective Chad Garcia from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, one of the investigators in charge of the Sweetheart murders, suggested that Edward might have been responsible for 15 other murders, including the famous Zodiac killings. Retired homicide detective John Cameron also believed Edward was responsible for the Zodiac killings and other high-profile unsolved cases but these claims have not been proven as of yet, so they are considered conspiracy theories. On April 7, 2011, Edward Edwards passed away at the Corrections Medical Center, Columbus, Ohio, at age 77. His death was of natural causes, a relatively merciful ending to a vicious crime spree that left five dead and dozens wracked with grief. Edward escaped execution by lethal injection, which had been set for August 31, 2011. Although Edward was eventually arrested, and he ultimately did not get away with the murders of Tim and Kelly, their family members have not exactly found relief in that. Kelly's mother, Norma Walker, said instead of getting closure, Edward's arrest ripped open old wounds. She said, You hoped this day would come, but now that it's here, it's really hard. Everything starts all over again. All the memories come back. He robbed me of my daughter, robbed me of my Christmases, birthdays, weddings, everything families do together. 
As for Tim's family, the fact that their son and his girlfriend's killer had been found was enough. Tim's father, David, said he was just glad it's over and was grateful for the DNA technology that confirmed Edward was the killer. April Balasio, Edward's daughter whose tip helped close the cold case, now spends her time trying to help the families of victims with unsolved cases find closure. Through her podcast, The Clearing, she investigates cold murder cases and tries to get authorities to reopen them. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew had a bright future ahead of them that was violently snatched away by their killer, Edward Edwards. Edward the serial killer had nothing personal against the couple, they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, which makes it all the more tragic. Although Edward ultimately got arrested and sentenced to death for his crimes, some believe he escaped justice by dying of natural causes just weeks before he was scheduled to be executed. On November 10, 2015, the life of 30-year-old Pastor Davy Blackburn was forever altered when he returned home from the gym to his residence on Sunnyfield Court in Indianapolis, Indiana, only to be confronted with his worst nightmare. A young pastor comes home to find his pregnant wife shot in their home. Her attacker still on the loose. Now police are trying to piece together how and why this apparent robbery turned deadly. Inside the house, his 28-year-old wife, Amanda Blackburn, who was 12 weeks pregnant, lay on the living room floor, partially nude, grievously injured, and covered in blood. Rushing upstairs, he discovered their 15-month-old son, Weston, unharmed in his crib. Davy immediately dialed 911, as Amanda, though still alive, was in critical condition. Tragically, neither Amanda nor her unborn child would survive this horrific ordeal. The following day on November 11, 2015, Amanda was removed from life support and passed away. Who could have perpetrated such a heinous act against a pregnant woman? Was it a random robbery gone wrong? Or were there much darker motives at play? Get ready to delve into the mysteries of this case. One that, while officially solved, continues to pique the curiosity of countless individuals who suspect that there's more than meets the eye. Amanda Grace Byers was welcomed into the world on July 31, 1987, in Muskegon, Michigan, by her loving parents, Phil and Robin Byers. She was blessed with an older brother, James, and an elder sister named Amber. As the youngest in the family, Amanda was enveloped in love, and in return, never hesitated to bestow kindness upon others. She started school in Indianapolis, Indiana, before moving to Elkhart, Indiana in 1995 with her family. Amanda graduated from Elkhart Christian Academy in 2006, and she furthered her education at Pensacola Christian College in Pensacola, Florida, where she earned an associate's degree in 2008. Described as both beautiful and graceful, Amanda exuded confidence and grace in all that she did. Her spirit of never giving up was a testament to her character, and throughout her life, she steadfastly held on to her faith in God. Her family's strong Christian values, particularly her father's role as a pastor at the First Baptist Church in Elkhart, deeply influenced her. With a radiant smile that was her trademark, Amanda had a passion for uniting people in their faith in Jesus. It was only fitting that she would choose a life partner who started... It was only fitting that she would choose a life partner who shared her strong Christian values, and so she found Davy Blackburn. Davy, born on November 2, 1985 in Tuscaloosa, embarked on his educational journey at Tuscaloosa County High School before transferring to Shades Valley High School. During his father's tenure as a pastor at Brookview Wesleyan Church in Birmingham, Alabama, he pursued higher education at Southern Wesleyan University in South Carolina where he graduated with a degree in religion and media communication. Amanda and Davy met on a blind date set up by Amanda's sister, Amber, who was dating Davy's best friend, Gavin. Um, we were actually set up on a blind date. Um, my sister's boyfriend at the time um, went to college with Davy, met the freshman year, and he was like, dude, I didn't realize this, but I should totally hook you up with my girlfriend's sister. It was October 1st, 2005 and they all attended a concert featuring the Christian band Hawk Nelson. Although they didn't expect the date to go well, it turned out to be the beginning of something special. 
Their relationship moved quickly, but it faced the challenge of being long distance. They were both attending different colleges, and they could only see each other during breaks, typically for periods of about two weeks at a time. To make it work, they even sought counseling to improve their communication. Despite the distance, they knew they had found the one in each other and made the most of the time they could spend together. Davy saw Amanda as the missing piece that completed his life in a unique and irreplaceable way. Aside from Davy, Amanda shared an incredibly close bond with her sister, Amber, to the extent that they confided in each other about everything. They experienced significant life moments side by side, whether it was running marathons together or walking down the aisle together with their father. On August 1, 2008, Amanda and Davy Blackburn tied the knot shortly after Amanda's graduation. Following their nuptials, the couple initially established their home in Greenville, South Carolina, where Davy undertook the role of an assistant pastor at New Spring Church. However, the tug of their previous home grew stronger, prompting their return to Indianapolis by 2012. Together, this young couple embarked on a journey of creating Resonant Church, an institution designed to offer worship and guidance to young individuals, with its message finely tuned to resonate with the hearts of the youth. Amanda and Davy were both deeply committed to their church, with Davy serving as the pastor. Collectively, they invested a significant portion of their time in counseling and guiding the church community. They engaged in extensive discussions on topics such as relationship advice, marital challenges, and intimate relationships, drawing from their own experiences and faith to offer support and guidance to those in need. Alongside the church, their own family began to flourish as on July 28, 2014, the couple welcomed their son, Weston, into the world. As expected, Amanda proved to be an exceptional mother, dedicating all her time and love to her precious child. Therefore, the decision to expand their family further was an easy one. Amanda became pregnant for the second time in 2015. Although they never underwent an official test to determine the gender, both Davy and Amanda were convinced that their second child would be a girl. They even selected the name Everett for the baby, who was expected to arrive on May 18, 2016. Tragically, Amanda would never live to see that day. On the fateful morning of November 10, 2015, just shortly after 8.30 a.m., the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department received a distressing 911 call from Davy Blackburn. He had found his wife Amanda, who was 12 weeks pregnant, collapsed inside their residence. In response to the urgent call, Indianapolis police officers swiftly arrived at the Blackburn residence, situated at the 2800 block of Sunnyfield Court on the northwest side of Indianapolis. They initiated an inquiry seeking to understand the sequence of events leading up to this tragic discovery. According to his account, the day began like any other. He awoke at approximately 4.30 a.m., dedicated time to reading his Bible and subsequently departed for LA Fitness Gym around 6 a.m. He explained that he had left the door unlocked due to the fact, at the time, they possessed only one house key, which was attached to his wife's key ring. Davy explained that he had spent approximately an hour at the gym and then concluded his workout session, starting his drive back home. During his drive, he was engrossed in a phone conversation with a friend, which continued even after he arrived home around 7.30 a.m. To avoid disturbing Amanda and their 15-month-old son, Weston, Davy opted to stay in his car in the driveway to finish up his conversation. His phone conversation came to an end around 8.20 a.m., and he made his way into the house and stumbled upon a scene straight out of a horror movie. On the living room floor, Amanda was lying face down, unconscious and covered in blood. Davy said he was initially uncertain about what had transpired, believing that Amanda might have fainted due to a dizzy spell and that a decorative ladder in the living room had accidentally fallen on her. I, I, can't, I can't imagine any reason why. I mean, we, we, we're confused, we're, we don't understand why, we, um, you know, there's, we're angry, we're, we're, we're not really sure what to do. However, as he looked closer, he noticed that her pants were removed 
Her underwear was neatly folded under her left thigh, and her shirt pulled over her head, as if somebody was trying to take it off. Although she was lying in a pool of blood, she was still breathing. Deeply concerned about the safety of their 15-month-old son, Davy ran upstairs to reach Weston's room, where he found the child safe and unharmed in his crib. Overwhelmed by a flood of emotions, he promptly dialed 911 to request urgent assistance. 911, it's a case of emergency. Uh, my wife, I just walked in the door, coming back from the gym. She's collapsed. She's breathing right now, but she's, there's blood all over the place coming out of her nose, it looks like. She's still breathing. I didn't want to turn her over. While they entered the house, officers discovered Amanda in the exact condition Davy had described. She was clinging to life, and paramedics engaged in a relentless battle to resuscitate her. When that failed, they rushed her to the hospital in hopes of saving both her and her onboard child, racing against time. With this critical situation unfolding, the investigation swung into motion. Even though suspicion had never been directed at Davy, it was standard procedure to commence the investigation with a close examination of the spouse. So the investigators visited the LA Fitness Gym where Davy had been that morning. Following a thorough confirmation of his alibi, Davy was quickly cleared from any involvement in the murder. With this crucial step completed, the investigative efforts could be concentrated on the crime scene itself. The officers instantly observed a series of irregularities within the scene. Amanda's wallet and credit cards were strewn across the floor. A pack of Swisher Sweet cigars were conspicuously placed on the kitchen counter. And a decorative lamp had been knocked over in close proximity to where Amanda lay, all of which pointed to a violent struggle. The presence of the cigars was particularly perplexing as neither Amanda nor Davy were smokers. This scene bore the haunting marks of the violence and confrontation that had transpired just hours earlier. While investigators were diligently searching for clues, Amanda was fighting for her life. Tragically, she wouldn't survive. On November 11, 2015, she was taken off life support and passed away, along with her unborn baby, leaving her family in mourning over her tragic murder and desperate for justice. The autopsy report unveiled the cruel and horrific extent of the violence inflicted upon Amanda. Contrary to Davy's initial impression that she might have been struck in the head, the report indicated that she had sustained three gunshot wounds, one to her arm, another to her upper back, and the fatal one to the back of her head. In addition to the gunshot wounds, there were telling signs of trauma, including scratches on her left cheek, a split lip, and the loss of a lower tooth, painting a distressing picture of the physical ordeal she had endured. Throughout the crime scene, extensive DNA swabs were conducted, spanning the entirety of the house. This methodical investigation led to the discovery of a variety of items and pieces of evidence, such as a roll of duct tape, earphones, a bullet, and scattered change on the floor. Collectively, these findings painted a vivid picture of the chaos of the crime scene. Additionally, the caliber of the bullets was identified as either a 38 or 9mm, providing a crucial clue regarding the potential weapon utilized in this tragic incident. Another vital clue emerged within the confines of the home. Amanda's cell phone was located in her bedroom, and upon examination, investigators noticed that she had received an email alert at 7.53 a.m. on the morning of the home invasion notifying her about a suspicious transaction involving her Chase debit card. Subsequent investigation revealed that the debit card had been stolen. This digital breadcrumb initiated a chain of investigative steps that would eventually lead the detectives to a series of ATM transactions. These transactions, in turn, led to the discovery of surveillance footage capturing a suspect in the act of attempting to withdraw money. The individual in the footage had wrapped a pink shirt around his face in an effort to conceal his identity, marking a significant breakthrough in the investigation. He was also wearing a dark colored vest. This evidence unmistakably indicated that the home invasion had, in fact, been a robbery that tragically escalated into a deadly confrontation. Around the same time, a series of burglaries in the same vicinity began to reveal a pattern too conspicuous to overlook. 
On that very morning of November 10th at 5.23 a.m., Jacola Searsbrook, a resident of the same neighborhood, placed a call to 911 to report a break-in. She recounted to the police that she had woken at 4.30 a.m., only to discover her cell phone missing from her bedroom. As she ventured further, she discovered that her sliding glass door was ajar, her potted plants had been disturbed, and her Apple MacBook, purse, headphones, car keys, and even a pack of Swisher cigars were all gone. In an even more disturbing turn of events, her 2007 Chrysler Sebring was absent from the parking lot. The investigation also unveiled that the apartment surveillance cameras capturing still images of the three individuals entering the premises. Although their identities remained undisclosed, it was determined that the burglars had gained access by cutting the porch screen and subsequently opening the sliding door. However, they had disabled the camera during the actual burglary, further obscuring their identification. The second 911 call that morning was placed at 8.17 a.m. by Allison Becker, a neighbor who resided on the same street as Davy and Amanda. She reported that she had not been at home that morning and returned to discover that her residence had fallen victim to a burglary. The thieves made off with four televisions, a MacBook Pro, a Tiffany pearl necklace, a pink woman sweater, an AT&T remote, a bag of oranges, and a few bed sheets, likely used to wrap the stolen items for transport. As the investigation unfolded, it became apparent that this apartment was also equipped with a security camera, which much like the others had been disabled. This time at 5.36 a.m., Detectives pieced together that the burglars had entered the apartment by cutting through the porch screen and somehow managed to unlock the deadbolt, securing the sliding glass door. To add to the unnerving atmosphere, it appeared that the robbers had settled in, consuming wine and beer before departing, leaving the emptied bottles behind. These unsettling actions hinted at a disturbing level of confidence the burglars had. Detectives at this point believed that the same group might have been responsible for the string of burglaries in the area and could have been responsible for the death of Amanda and her unborn baby. As the police conducted inquiries throughout the neighborhood to seek information on any suspicious activities from the day of the robberies, they indeed found several individuals who had witnessed unusual occurrences. One neighbor recounted that just before 7 a.m. on that ill-fated morning, she had seen a man dressed entirely in black, with a hood concealing his head, walking in front of her house. Another witness recalled seeing the same man who was engaged in a loud conversation on his phone, with a t-shirt pulled over his face. By 7.10 a.m., yet another neighbor reported observing a Chrysler Sebring pull up alongside the man. The man was seen entering the car, which then quickly departed. This information expanded the investigative net, eventually revealing another crucial clue. Surveillance footage from one resident's camera captured both the car and the man. Another witness came forward to report that on the morning of November 10, 2015, she heard two loud noises accompanied by a woman's screams, a chilling detail that led the police to theorize that this might have been the moment when Amanda was attacked. The stolen Chrysler Sebring emerged as a pivotal link, unmistakably connecting the dots between the series of burglaries. Remarkably, it was discovered abandoned by the side of the road, not far from the Blackburn residence, on November 11, 2015, the very day Amanda tragically passed away. A comprehensive search of the vehicle led to the discovery of some of the stolen items alongside an ATM receipt, indicating a denied transaction attempt of $500 conducted using Amanda's debit card at 6.36 a.m. on November 10. This evidence was supported by the ATM surveillance footage, capturing a man with his face concealed in a pink sweater, as it was previously mentioned. However, this time another significant piece of evidence emerged. The same man was seen in surveillance footage of a nearby ATM at 6.54 a.m., successfully completing a transaction for $400. This evidence strongly suggested that Amanda had been attacked almost immediately after Davy left the house that morning. Nonetheless, DNA samples were collected from the car and subsequently forwarded for testing, with the results screened through CODIS to identify any potential matches. By November 17, 2015, investigators received a breakthrough, a DNA match that finally put a suspect on their radar.
The DNA discovered in the car was linked to a 21-year-old man named Jalen Watson. Intriguingly, Jalen had only been released from prison on August 6, 2015, following a previous conviction for burglary, and he was currently on parole. Delving into Jalen's Facebook account, detectives unearthed a connection between him and a 24-year-old man named Deano Gordon, who also happened to be on parole for burglary. The plot continued to thicken as the investigators tracked the location data associated with the phone numbers of both these men on the morning of November 10th. The unfolding sequence of events began to reveal itself through the location pings from their phones. At 4.40 a.m., roughly coinciding with the timing of the first robbery, their phones pinged off the tower nearest to the initial home. This pattern recurred with the second robbery and chillingly corresponded to the estimated time of Amanda's murder at 6.25 a.m. The digital footprints left behind continued to be traced, leading investigators to the towers closest to the ATMs, where Amanda's stolen debit card was used at 6.39 a.m., and then once more at 6.54 a.m. Gradually, the pieces of the puzzle were coming together, painting a clearer picture of the crime spree. Deeper scrutiny of Jalen's communications ultimately led to the discovery of the third and youngest member of the burglar trio an 18-year-old named Larry Taylor Jr. A review of the communication records unveiled conversations that implicated Larry in the crime that morning. Born in 1997, relatively little was known about Larry, who would soon take on a central role in Amanda Blackburn's murder. Similar to his associates, Larry also had a criminal history that included misdemeanor charges, one of which involved an incident of public nudity and indecency where he had exposed himself to a woman in a parking lot. Investigators proceeded to obtain the phone number Jalen had provided for his parole board, which turned out to belong to his older sister, Giornita. When the police spoke with her, she disclosed that on that night prior to the tragic events, Larry, Jalen, and Diano had been hanging out at her apartment. They departed the apartment at 3.30 a.m. on November 10th. Additionally, she shared with the authorities, that one of the three men had been wearing a dark vest that morning, corroborating a description provided by a witness. Giornita also handed over a 9mm pistol that had been brought to the apartment, likely by either Jalen or Diano, and left under her bed. On that fateful morning, the trio's criminal activities began with burglaries, which evolved into something far more sinister in no time. According to a confidential informant whose identity remained undisclosed, Larry, Jalen, and Diano had ventured out in the early morning hours with the intention of breaking into a residence to obtain some money. Larry had also brought along a 38 revolver with him. They arrived at Jacola Searsbrook apartment on the east side of Indianapolis on foot. Larry was the first to gain entry into Jacola's apartment and then let the other two inside through the front door. Following the theft of numerous items, the trio fled the scene, using Jacola's car for transportation. They initially drove to the residence of Jalen's child's mother, located near 38th and Kessler Boulevard, with the intention of him being dropped off there. However, as he was unable to establish contact with the woman, they departed and headed to a nearby neighborhood to engage in further burglaries. While in the neighborhood, the men noticed a house with a back porch that appeared vulnerable to intrusion. This particular residence was situated on Sunnyfield Court and belonged to Allison Becker, who was not present at home during that time. The men parked the car and gained entry to the home through the patio door. After spending some time inside consuming alcohol and stealing numerous items, they eventually exited the apartment to load the pilfered possessions into their car. It was at this point that Larry informed the others that he had observed someone departing from a neighboring home, leading them to believe that this residence might be unoccupied. Once they had completed loading their vehicle, the three of them drove to that particular home. It was the marital home of Amanda and Davy. Upon entering the residence through the unlocked front door, the men immediately spotted a purse on the kitchen counter, taking the money it contained and dividing it among themselves. Additionally, they confiscated some credit cards found there. As they continued to search the rest of the home, they unexpectedly encountered Amanda. The men formulated a plan to use Amanda's credit cards at an ATM to obtain money. Their initial attempt to persuade Amanda to accompany them was met with her refusal, and when they tried to physically compel her to leave, 
She resisted and dropped to the ground. So it was decided that Jalen and Deanna would go to the ATM, while Larry would remain behind with Amanda and her son, who was still asleep in his room upstairs. The informant further disclosed that Jalen and Deanna proceeded to drive to a nearby Chase ATM, but they encountered difficulties in using the card with that particular machine. Jalen and Deanna then called Larry, who apparently provided them with the correct ATM passcode. From there, they drove to a different Chase Bank ATM located in the vicinity of 86th Street and Ditch Road. After parking there, Jalen exited the vehicle and approached the ATM. Given the cold weather, he wrapped the pink sweater that had been acquired from Allison's residence around his face. On this occasion, he successfully withdrew $400 from the ATM, which was then divided between Jalen and Deano. Meanwhile, Larry placed several calls to Deano, expressing his frustration and demanding that they return to the Blackburn's residence to pick him up. Eventually, they complied with his request, but by the time they got there, Larry had already left the Blackburn's house and was walking down the street with a backpack he had taken from the home. Larry was reportedly in a state of panic and urged the others to simply leave him behind. He instructed Jalen to drive to an apartment complex, situated at 56 in Georgetown, where they left him at the residence of an individual referred to as Shy. While en route, Larry disclosed to them that he had attempted to sleep with Amanda, but she had rejected his advances. As a result, he had shot her once, and as she fell down, he shot her again in the back of her head. Eventually, the men abandoned Jacola's car near 38th Street and Brookwood Drive in Indianapolis and went their separate ways. The diligent efforts of the Indianapolis police, combined with the mounting evidence, culminated in the arrest of all three individuals responsible for Amanda's tragic death, just two weeks after the incident. There's been a major development in a high-profile murder case. A teenager is now under arrest this morning in the murder of an Indiana pastor's pregnant wife. Overnight, police in Indianapolis confirming that after a nearly two-week-long investigation, they have made an arrest in the murder of 28-year-old Amanda Blackburn. 18-year-old Larry Taylor taken into custody Sunday on a preliminary charge of murder. Larry faced a total of 13 charges including murder, burglary, criminal confinement while armed with a deadly weapon, and robbery resulting in serious bodily injury. His accomplice, Jalen, was charged with 10 offenses which included murder, burglary, robbing resulting in serious bodily injury, and auto theft. Initially, the third accomplice, Deano, was charged with burglary and theft, but as the case developed, he too faced the charges of murder. The dark saga of Larry Taylor extended even further, with revelations about his potential involvement in other heinous crimes coming to light. On November 4, 2015, just a week before Amanda's murder, the lifeless body of Rolando Gonzalez Hernandez, a 27-year-old Mexican man, was discovered next to his car at his apartment complex, having been fatally shot in the head. Witnesses shared with authorities that Larry had openly boasted about a robbery and shooting that had occurred at the same apartment complex, using derogatory language to describe the victim based on his ethnicity. According to Larry, the robbery had produced a measly sum of $10 from Rolando's wallet. Additionally, it was alleged that Larry had confided in other witnesses about breaking into a woman's home and subjecting her to a terrifying assault at gunpoint. Despite these allegations, Larry wasn't charged with these crimes due to insufficient evidence. However, there was no escaping the consequences of his actions in the case of Amanda. Yet the legal procedure to bring Larry and his accomplices to justice was not only complex, but long drawn out spanning two to three years of legal maneuvering, plea negotiations, and the anticipation of a trial. Ultimately, Deano and Jalen reached agreements that required them to testify against Larry during his bench trial. In exchange for their cooperation, the murder charges against them were dismissed. Jalen was sentenced to 29 years in prison, while Deano received a 30-year sentence. The trial of Larry Taylor Jr. didn't start until December 2021, However, when it finally did, an unusual situation arose. His defense attorney successfully persuaded the court to withhold information about Amanda's unborn child from the jury, even though Larry had originally been charged with the baby's death as well. Nevertheless, the jurors somehow discovered Amanda's pregnancy during the trial, 
prompting the judge to declare a mistrial due to concerns that it might evoke sympathy from the jury. A second trial was scheduled for June 2022. However, another obstacle arose. Some jurors had become aware of the previous mistrial and were discussing it among themselves. As a result, the judge declared another mistrial, further prolonging the legal proceedings. The third attempt to try Larry for Amanda's murder was scheduled for October 2022. In this trial, the prosecution relied on the testimonies of Deano and Jalen, cell phone data, and other witness accounts. Thankfully, the trial proceeded without any more unexpected revelations, and by September 2022, a verdict was reached. Ultimately, Larry Taylor was convicted on various charges, which encompassed murder, burglary, theft, criminal confinement, auto theft, and unlawful possession of a handgun. The court sentenced Larry to 86 years of imprisonment, ultimately concluding a chaotic legal odyssey linked to the tragic loss of Amanda Grace Blackburn and her unborn baby. The verdict undoubtedly brought solace to Amanda's grieving family. Davey even went as far as to express his forgiveness toward his wife's killers. I feel like forgiving. I feel like being angry. I feel like being mad. I feel like being frustrated. I feel like slipping into despair. But the problem with that is, is there, that doesn't lead down to any good road. However, the irreplaceable loss of Amanda remains a permanent void. Sadly, Amanda's son Weston has had to grow up without the presence of his mother, having only been allowed to spend 15 months with her. The hardest part for me in this whole process is, is thinking about him growing up without his mom. She poured out her life to serve people. Um, everything she did was oriented around loving Jesus, loving people. Weston celebrated his ninth birthday this year and has been thriving under the care of his father who has found a new path in life. In December 2017, two years after Amanda's tragic death, Davy entered into a new chapter by marrying Christy Monroy, a single mother who attended resident church and shared the same CrossFit gym with Davy. On November 4, 2019, Christy, who had a daughter named Natalia from her previous marriage, gave birth to Davy's son, Cohen David Parker Blackburn. Currently, the blended family is flourishing, as evident from their active social media presence and blog post. Usually, this would be the conclusion of our story. However, in this case, there are lingering unanswered questions and missing pieces of the puzzle that have left some people wondering if there's more to the story. Today, we will explore the alternate theories that have piqued people's curiosity, allowing you to form your own opinion. So, without further delay, Let's delve into the uncharted territory we've previously left unexplored. Before we proceed, we want to mention that most of this information is allegations or rumors, and Davy had never been under suspicion in the official investigation. We want to make it clear that we do not intend to spread misinformation or support any kind of propaganda. We apologize if anything we have said in this video has hurt somebody's feelings, as it is not our intention to do so. Some people believe that Davey might have been involved in his wife's murder, and he was the one who orchestrated it. Several factors have raised questions about his innocence. For starters, it was revealed that during the investigation, that just two months before Amanda's death, Davey had taken out a significant life insurance policy on her. Strangely, this policy came into effect after a mere eight weeks. Coincidentally, right after Amanda's death, Davey benefited greatly from this. But was it intentional? No one knows. Coming back to the day of the home invasion, there were some unusual deviations in Davy's routine. Those familiar with Davy would attest that he typically left for the gym at 5.30 a.m., but on this particular day, he was a half an hour late. His wake-up time was no different than usual, leaving some to wonder about the reason for this anomaly. Furthermore, his workouts typically spanned an hour, but on this occasion, it lasted only 45 minutes excluding the driving time. Additionally, some find it implausible that Davy would sit in his car for an entire hour without entering his home. In light of these anomalies, certain theories have emerged, speculating that he might have been waiting for his wife's tragic fate to unfold. The 911 call in this case is a matter that has drawn significant attention among web sleuths, and for good reason. There are several troubling aspects to it. 
First and foremost, the time it took Davy to call 911 is unusual. He waited for almost 12 minutes before seeking help, despite discovering his spouse in a severely injured state and covered in blood. This extended delay raises questions. Moreover, the most unsettling part of the 911 call is Davy's strangely composed demeanor. While on the call as the dispatcher connected to another line, Davy remained eerily silent. She is. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Stay on the line for EMS while I transfer you. He made no effort to wake Amanda or communicate with her, even though he knew she was still breathing. This behavior is highly unusual, given the severity of the situation. It's equally perplexing that Davy initially thought Amanda had been in an accident, when in reality she had been viciously attacked and left for dead. These factors contribute to the mystery and speculation surrounding the case. There's another aspect of this case that has raised questions among some observers. They have pointed out how Davy appeared to be capitalizing on this tragedy. During Amanda's funeral, he continuously tweeted the hashtag, Nothing is Wasted. Shortly after the funeral, he legally registered the domain name, Nothing is Wasted, and even used that quote to brand her tombstone. He went on to release a podcast, a book, a blog, all under the same brand name, detailing his personal journey through Amanda's death and the healing process. Critics have pointed out that some of his statements and blog posts seem to revolve around himself, which has raised questions about potential narcissism. For instance, just hours after the arrest in the case, he released a statement in which he expressed rapid forgiveness for the individuals responsible for the death of his spouse. I feel like forgiving. I feel like being angry. I feel like being mad. I feel like being frustrated. I feel like slipping into despair. But the problem with that is, is there, that doesn't lead down to any good road. For some, the speed at which he chose to forgive those who had essentially torn his world apart was unsettling. His quote, the best is yet to come, has led to speculation and discussions about Davy's motivations and behavior. Comparisons drawn from Davy's post have highlighted how he sometimes appears distant in his narratives. Some people have observed that he presents the murder in a very matter-of-a-fact way and rarely mentions his unborn child, who tragically never had a chance to come into the world. On multiple occasions, Davy has expressed that while the incident has been painful for him, he wouldn't change any of it, and he believes that Amanda is where she needs to be, by Jesus' side. It's possible that Davy, as a man of faith, has accepted everything life has thrown his way, no matter how tragic. He might genuinely be grateful for the life he has been given, despite the immense losses he has suffered. However, whether coincidental or intentional, some of his behavior and statements have raised red flags for certain individuals. In a bizarre coincidence, just two weeks before Amanda's tragic death, Davy delivered a sermon in which he acted out a murder scene, repeatedly shooting someone in the back with an airsoft gun. This performance was intended to illustrate how worship could be metaphorically used as a weapon. To sing, it became a weapon, don't worry, this is an airsoft gun, a weapon to battle worry. I thought we'd just have some fun with it. Come here, Zach, come on. Because sometimes you just need to be reminded. Dare, come hold my microphone. You just be, need to be reminded that when you get that phone call, Instead of worrying about it, step over here, because I'm going to go crossways. Instead of worrying about it, maybe you need to worship. Boom. Instead of worrying about the medical bill, maybe you need to worship. Instead of, I missed right there, but it's okay if your worship misses, just go again. Maybe instead of worrying so much about your kids, you need to lift it up and surrender to Jesus and worship. Maybe instead of worrying about the job situation, you need to worship. Maybe instead of worrying about the project at school, you need to study and then worship. Maybe instead of worrying about what other people think about you, you need to worship. If this video wasn't eerie enough, another incident left many people shocked. In 2018, Davy and his current wife, Christy, dressed as robbers for a Halloween party 
and even posted pictures on social media. What added to the unease was the presence of a ladder in the picture, bearing eerie similarities to the circumstances of Amanda's murder. This costume choice coming just a few years after such a tragic event raised numerous questions and concerns. Concerns have also been raised by some individuals regarding how swiftly authorities cleared Davy of suspicion. As a renowned local pastor with connections to influential figures and law enforcement, some believe that Davy was never thoroughly investigated. Additionally, theories began to circulate based on Davy and Amanda's own Q&A videos in which they discussed their marital difficulties and how they overcame them to become soulmates. Welcome Davey and Amanda to the stage for Q&A right now. Come on, let's go, give it up. There you go, there you go. Some people speculated that their marital problems led Davey to seek a way to eliminate his wife. However, it's important to note that while these theories sound like elements of a dark plot, they remain purely circumstantial and have never been substantiated. In fact, it's essential to acknowledge certain gaps in these theories, with a major one being, if Davey was involved in the murder, why did none of the individuals involved, Jalen, Diano, or Larry, ever mention his name? Ultimately, we leave it to our audience to decide whether the truth lies in what's already known, or if there's something concealed beneath the surface, as we conclude our story here. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you believe Davey had any involvement in his wife's murder? Or do you consider these allegations to be entirely baseless, with the actual killer already behind bars? Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, please let us know your recommendations in the comment box. It was summer in the suburbs of Belhaven, Greenwich, on the fine evening of October 30th, 1975. Martha was trying her best to convince her mother to let her out for mischief night, the night before Halloween, when she and her friends would play out harmless pranks around the neighborhood. After some determined convincing, Dorothy, Martha's mother, finally gave up to her pleas and let her out. As hours went by, the worry of her missing child made Dorothy call a few of her friends, only to find out that no one had seen Martha. The search for her started, but didn't take too long. Martha would be found merely 200 feet away from her house, underneath a pine tree, bludgeoned to death with a golf club. What happened on the night of 30th October? Who could have done something so cruel to such a young soul? And what secrets hide behind the walls of elitist Belhaven? Greenwich is one of the oldest towns in Connecticut, full of rich history and culture. Only a 15-minute train ride to New York City, this coastal town gives you the charming New England feel, as well as the vibrant and exciting city life. The members of Belhaven community were known for their class and power, and no one would have ever suspected that such an affluent society would get their hands tainted behind the barbed golden doors. Social butterfly Martha Elizabeth Moxley was known for her extroverted, fun-loving nature. Born to Dorothy and John David Moxley on August 16, 1960, Martha was the youngest member of the family along with her elder brother, John. After Martha's dad got transferred from his job at Piedmont, California in 1974, the whole family moved out to a spacious new mansion in Connecticut. Moving 3,000 miles away from her home into the wealthy suburbs of Belhaven might have been a big change for everyone, but Martha was very adaptable. Within a very short span of time, she made quite a few friends and classmates were often drawn towards her vivacious personality and self-confidence. Within the short nine months in town, she was already voted out the most popular girl at Western Junior High School. Martha's swift gain of popularity also got her famous with the boys. Martha was a person who had everything in the world going for her. She was known to be friendly, athletic, and talented in the arts. Everything seemed to come very easily to Martha. Her brother John recalled in an interview, She was very easy to get along with, upbeat, friendly, the kind of kid you'd like to be around. Despite her raging popularity, Martha was described to be a family-oriented person. She would often spend her time around the house making sketches or playing with Tiger, her cat. But just like any other teenage kid, she too had a wilder side. In the summer of 1975, Martha would spend most of her days at the Bellhaven Club playing tennis or just idly swimming. 
she would often socialize around the pool with other children of exclusive clubs. The kids of these clubs were described to be of a different breed, unlike her other friends. They went to private academies and boarding schools and enjoyed a wealth that was daunting, even by Greenwich standards. Amongst these kids, one family especially stood out, and that was the Skakel family, cousins to the infamous Kennedys. Martha was known to share close connections with the Skakel boys, Thomas and Michael. The Skakels were neighbors to the Moxley family. Michael and Thomas Skakel were both nephews of Ethel Skakel and her husband, Robert F. Kennedy. The families related too, and Robert happened to be the brother of the late president, John F. Kennedy. Ethel Skakel's brother, Rushton, and his wife, Anne, had seven children. Amongst them were Thomas and Michael Skakel, who were 17 and 15 year old, respectively, at the time of Martha's murder in 1975. The Skakels were far from a happy family. Michael Skakel would later cite chronic illness, alcoholism, and a repressive Catholic morale and sexual outlook as persistent causes for household turmoil. In 1973, Ann Skakel passed away from brain cancer, leaving her alcoholic husband, Rushton Skakel, to further delve into a worse state. He would often leave the children home alone with insufficient supervision and unlimited funds. Michael Skakel expressed that even a more intense level of chaos came to rule our household as a result of his mother's death. The Moxleys lived just about 150 yards away from them. The Skakels would often have a constant stream of teenagers at their place, thanks to the lack of parental supervision. Martha was experiencing her best summer days within the comfort of the gated community in Bellhaven. Her teenage years were filled with occasional sneaking out, added with smoking and a few beers. In her diary, Martha shared a few instances that happened over the course of these holidays. Many of them were in reference to the Skakel boys, as Martha was especially concerned with the advancements she was receiving from Thomas. On September 12, 1975, she wrote, Dear Diary, Me, Jackie, Michael, Thomas, Hope, Maureen, and Andra, when driving in Tom's car, I was practically sitting on Thomas's lap because I was only steering. He kept putting his hands on my knee. Then I was driving again, and Tom put his arm around me. He kept doing stuff like that. Martha also wrote a note about Michael on September 19, 1975, which said, Michael was so totally out of it that he was being a real asshole in his actions and words. He kept telling me that I was leading Tom on when I don't like him, except as a friend. I said, well, how about you and Jackie? You keep telling me that you don't like her and you're all over her. He doesn't understand that he can be nice to her without hanging all over her. It was quite evident that Martha had mixed feelings about the Skakel brothers, and often reconsidered if she should stop hanging around their place. The doubt of her own safety and comfort kept looming over her mind, but no one could have expected what was coming next. On October 30, 1975, Mischief Hour arrived. Martha did her best to convince her mother to let her out with her friends, John, Martha's dad, was out on a business trip, so she tried every trick in the book to get her mother's approval. After some consistent nagging, Dorothy fell short to her daughter's pleas and gave her permission to go out for the night. Bellhaven was a well-secured community. Everyone coming in and going out was well inspected, and crimes within such a safe locality were highly unlikely. Martha went out with her friends, Jackie, Jeffrey, and Helen. The three of them went over to Skakel's place, where they were supposed to meet with Kennedy cousins. The night went on, and soon enough midnight struck. Dorothy was used to her daughter occasionally missing her curfew, so her panic didn't settle in till 2 a.m. At first, she thought Martha might have just slept over at her friend's place. She called Martha's best friend, Sheila, in search of her whereabouts, only to find out that she hadn't seen her since 9.30 p.m., about the same time when all the kids went back home. After 3.30 a.m. rolled around, Dorothy was worried sick and decided to call their neighbor, Thomas Skakel who also replied the same thing as Sheila. After 3.35 a.m., she finally gave up and ended up calling the police for help. The local Greenwich officers were sent to the Moxley household almost immediately. After a quick check around the neighborhood with Dorothy, they couldn't find anything out of sorts. The officers ended up giving assurance to Dorothy and asked her to wait till the morning, although right before the officers headed back, they sent out Martha's information to all the nearby stations to stay alert for any sightings of Martha. Dorothy soon fell asleep beside the window, waiting for her daughter to show up. The following morning of October 31, 1975, Dorothy rushed over to Martha's room, 
only to find her bed empty. The police were called in yet again, and a deep unsettling feeling had started to creep over her. She knew something wasn't right. Dorothy couldn't just sit back and wait, so she decided to go around the neighborhood with her son John, and the first place she went to look was the Skakel household. Over the course of 15 months of them living here, Dorothy had never been over to her neighbor's house, and the first thing she was greeted with was their aggressive dog. Pretty shaken up from the frightening encounter, she knocked on the door, and the younger Skakel brother Michael opened it soon after. I'm Dorothy Moxley, and I live across the street, and I'm looking for my daughter Martha. Do you know if Martha is here? No, Martha was not there. And he looked, he didn't look healthy. He looked, well, I actually think he looked hungover. In spite of that, Dorothy was adamant to find something, so she asked to take a look over at the camper parked outside. She assumed that Martha might have just fallen asleep in the back of the camper, but after checking inside, her hopes were crushed, as it was empty as well. The word of Martha's disappearance had gone around the locality by this time, and friends and neighbors had come along with the police to inspect the grounds of Bellhaven. Not long after noon, Martha's friend Sheila rushed over to the Moxley household. Shivering in fear, she fumbled to come up with the words to describe what she just witnessed. Through her tears, Sheila pleaded with Martha's mom to call 911 for help. She said something terrible had happened, and Martha's not moving. Someone had attacked her, and they needed to get help. Dorothy's friend Jean, who was with her at the time, asked her to stay put as he went back to check on what had happened. As soon as Jean reached the site, he made a gruesome discovery. Two hundred feet away from her house, lying face down under a large pine tree at the edge of the Moxley property, was the missing teen. The back of her head was bludgeoned, and the broken golf club was sticking right out through the back of her neck. Martha's clothes were bloodstained, and her jeans and underwear were pulled down to her ankles. Near the teenager was a broken six-iron golf club, which was used to strike Martha repeatedly in the head. The impact was so forceful, the club was found broken into three pieces. The broken golf club pieces were laying all over the ground near her body, everything except the grip of the handle. The law enforcement officers were stunned at the discovery of the body. Greenwich hadn't experienced a violent crime case in the last 30 years, let alone something as heinous as this. The local police were highly unprepared to handle the severity of the given situation. For further thorough investigation, a team from Connecticut County Station was assigned. Forensics at the scene did their best to gather as much evidence as possible, and Martha's body was sent out for autopsy. There was no evidence of sexual assault traced during the autopsy, and the blunt force of her head was found as the initial cause of death. It was later discovered that young Martha Moxley remained a virgin till the end of her life. Whilst the investigation was ongoing, Greenwich local police officers started gathering alibis from every witness they knew to figure out the exact timeline of the homicide. The first person on the list were the Skakel brothers. The police interrogated both the boys on the same day, and they presented their respective alibis for the time of the murder. When questioned, Thomas Skakel told detectives that he last saw Martha around 9.30 p.m. outside his house. He said after he bid goodbye to her, he went straight inside, where he joined the family's new live-in tutor, Kenneth Littleton, to watch The French Connection. Thomas soon after went back to his room, later to work on a school report on Abraham Lincoln. His teachers, however, denied they had ever given such an assignment. Thomas was eventually given two polygraph tests. The results to the first one remained inconclusive, but Thomas passed the second one. Michael Skakel told detectives that he had left his house around 9.15 p.m., and drove to his cousin Jimmy Turin's house, returning around 11 p.m. The police immediately felt a bit doubtful towards Michael's statement, but didn't have any hard proof to pin him as a suspect to the case. 24-year-old Kenneth Littleton was also investigated in the fall of 1976. He told police he heard noises outside the house sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. Before he stepped out, Littleton said he checked up on all the seven Skakel children and Michael, along with his older brother Thomas and two other Skakel boys, were not at home during that time. According to reports by Detective Solomon, well, his story was that he heard some noises coming from the bushes on the property, leaves rustling, but he claimed he did not see anything at the time he was out. Littleton further added that he didn't see Thomas until 10.25, when Thomas joined him in front of the TV. The other Skakel boys came home within a half hour, Littleton reportedly had no idea who Martha Moxley was, 
The night of her murder was actually his first night at the Skakels. Although he failed several lie detector tests, Littleton was never charged with any connection to the case. Amidst the active investigation, police came across two startling pieces of evidence. Martha Moxley had been beaten and stabbed with a Tony Payne golf club. These golf clubs were engraved with the initials of Ann Skakel, and upon further inspection, the same golf clubs were found at the Skakel household, but one was missing. Their father, Rushton Skakel, who previously was out for a hunting trip, rushed back home upon hearing the news of Martha's murder. Although during the beginning of the investigation, he was quite cooperative with inspections and statements he soon halted his relations with the police. On January 22, 1976, the Skakels, on the advice of their attorneys, refused to answer any more questions and ended their family's cooperation with investigators. The second thing which raised quite a few questions were the alibis given by Martha's friends. On the evening of October 30, 1975, Martha Moxley left with her friends to participate in Mischief Night, in which the neighborhood youths would ring bells and pull pranks such as toilet papering houses. According to her friends, Martha was seen flirting with the oldest Skakel brother, Thomas, and was eventually found kissing him moments later. One of her friends later mentioned that they had last seen Martha falling behind the fence with Thomas near the pool in Skakel's backyard at around 9.30 p.m. There were more than 200 scheduled interviews held by detectives within the next several months. All of them were given several polygraph exams to complete the process. Donald Brown, who was the state's attorney for Fairfield County at the time of Martha's murder, said, No one has an obligation to cooperate with the police. But in most instances, individuals who have some knowledge that may lead to the identification of an individual who has committed a violent crime are more than pleased to contribute that information to the police. So it's most unusual when an individual, possessing information, decides that he does not want to give that information to investigators. Initially, the case turned cold for almost two decades, due to lack of information. In 1991, Martha Moxley's case was reopened after a rumor that another Kennedy family member, William Smith Kennedy, may have been involved in the murder. William was on trial for assault charges, and though his connections to the Martha Moxley case were later closed off, this whole ordeal ended up getting the case restarted with new leads. Within the same year, the police brought in the well-known forensic pathologist, Dr. Henry Lee. Dr. Lee was able to utilize technology that was unavailable in 1975. Among the items examined by Dr. Lee were clothes found discarded in the Skakel's garbage shortly after the murder. We found some hairs and fibers. Some of the hair is microscopically similar to hers. Other hair is dissimilar to hers. Dr. Lee determined that the hair belonged to a Caucasian male. The problem was he didn't have any hair sample from any of the possible suspects and was unable to make a match. However, after studying the crime scene photographs, Dr. Lee was able to provide a possible motive for Martha's murder. The blood smear on her body indicates somebody tried to use force. It suggests a sexually motivated homicide. Michael quickly became the prime suspect in the case. Soon after, Rushton Skakel allegedly hired a private investigator to clear his family name. Privately, he hoped information would come out, which would cast suspicion on other suspects, namely former suspect Kenneth Littleton. However, his plan completely backfired. Private investigators Jim Murphy, a former FBI agent, and his assistant Willis Billy Krebs, a former NYPD lieutenant, were both now involved in the Martha Moxley case. When the two men interviewed Tom and Michael Skakel about their activities on the night of Moxley's murder, it turned out both boys had lied to the police. Thomas Skakel had disclosed that it was not 9.30 p.m. when he last saw Martha outside his house, but actually closer to 10 p.m. Also, before Thomas went back inside, he and Martha engaged in some inappropriate activity outside his home. According to Krebs, Thomas began to cry as he admitted this, but his lawyer cut him off before any more could be said. Meanwhile, Michael Skakel told the investigator that he did not go to bed when he arrived home from his cousin's house around 11 p.m. He'd actually climbed a tree outside Martha Moxley's bedroom window and engaged in some inappropriate activity. Author and journalist Dominic Dune got a hold of the investigator's report and passed it on to State Inspectors Frank Garr, who had previously been a detective on the case. Though he shared his suspicion about Michael Skakel previously, due to lack of information, it was dismissed. This report would give his theory new momentum. 
Leonard Levitt, an investigative reporter for the Long Island-based Newsday, covered the Moxley case in 1982. He also shared a similar theory about Michael. He shared that there were no defense wounds, which indicates she knew her attacker. Merely the fact that she was hit repeatedly with a golf club indicates some kind of rage, which personalized this thing, which indicates that there was such anger that the two had to have known each other, that it was a crime of passion. Levitt waited for 20 years to report on Martha Moxley. The report said Thomas and Michael Skakel had made startling admissions to the detectives. Both Thomas and Michael told the investigators that they had lied to the police about their accounts the night of the murder. Thomas said to them that after 9.30, he went inside his house, and then he went back out and spent another 20 minutes with Martha. He claims now that he and Martha engaged in a sexual act, and then he left her at about 10 to 10. If you go back now and you look at the story that he told, it just doesn't add up. In 1998, a one-man grand jury and an investigator were assigned to review the case of Martha Moxley. Upon examining the evidence, Judge George N. Thim ruled that there was enough to charge Michael Skakel with her murder. Michael was prosecuted with the charges of Martha's murder in his late 30s. It took the court almost two long decades to give justice at last. He was convicted after a three-week trial that relied largely on circumstantial evidence. Investigators had recovered part of the golf club, a six-iron from a set that had belonged to Michael's mother. But unfortunately, prosecutors had no direct physical evidence to tie Michael with the murder investigation. He claimed he was miles away from the murder scene at a cousin's place, where they watched Monty Python's Flying Circus. Even so, jurors later said they were convinced by the incriminating statements he had made, as well as his erratic behavior. Several former classmates of Skakel's later testified for the trial. Apparently, when Michael was in Elon School, a specialty school aimed at rehabilitating troubled youths, he had even confessed to them about Martha's murder. One former schoolmate, Gregory Coleman, testified in the pretrial hearing in June 2000 that Skakel told him that I'm going to get away with murder. I am a Kennedy. Coleman went on to say that he, Michael, had made a comment that he was trying to make advances towards this girl and that this girl was not complying with those advances and thus he drove her skull in. However, Coleman did not return to testify in Michael's murder trial in 2002, as he died in August 2001 of a heroin overdose. Michael, in particular, was known to have a troubling past. Though the Skakel secrets were well hidden, rumors of Michael's stay within the walls of Elon School caused quite an uproar. During a group session at his reform school, Michael let out a confession that he was the one who murdered Martha during the night of 30th October. However, the school's owner, Joe Risi, denied any such statements ever being made. Despite this, there were countless witness accounts who confirmed the story. During the Skakel trial, two of Michael's former classmates from Elon School came forward as witnesses. One of them was John D. Higgins. Higgins described the ordeal to be a tearful, dazed, and confused confession, where Michael said he only remembers fragments of his memories of the crime. Whereas Gregory Coleman, the other witness, said Michael quite brazenly stated that he was sure he would get away with Martha's murder due to his family name. After Michael Skakel was sent off to prison in August 2002, his cousin Robert Kennedy Jr. became his staunchest supporter. He solely believed that his cousin never committed the murder and was entirely getting framed due to political propaganda. I know Michael Skakel, and I know he didn't commit this crime. Kennedy said in his interview with CBS 48 Hours. In 1997, Michael Skakel made recordings with the ghostwriter Richard Hoffman for his autobiography, Dead Man Talking, A Kennedy Cousin Comes Clean. One specific recording played during the trial was particularly damning. Michael said that the night of Martha's murder, he was drunk, had been smoking marijuana, and was having inappropriate urges. When Dorothy Moxley came to his door that morning, Skakel panicked. He said on the recording, I was still high from the night before, a little drunk. He reported having thought to himself, did they see me last night? Michael claimed he was worried that anyone from the Moxley household might catch him in the act. He said that he engaged in some inappropriate acts while he was on their tree, but prosecutors argued that Michael was actually referring to being seen beating Martha with a golf club. The counter-argument from Michael's defense was that there was no physical evidence to convict him and that he had an alibi for the time frame in which Martha was murdered. 
Nonetheless, the prosecution used the trial to paint Michael as a jealous teen. They claimed Michael was infuriated by being rejected by his crush. While he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol, and with access to the murder weapon, he ended up acting on his thoughts. On June 7, 2002, the jury came back with a guilty verdict. Skakel was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. The jury and state superior court announced their verdict just after 10.30 a.m., shortly after starting its fourth day of deliberations. Rushed and Skakel appeared almost stunned as the foreman pronounced the verdict in the packed silent courtroom. The public rejoiced at the justice given. It was one of the most complicated and tragic cases in the Northeast, surrounded by a swirl of wealth and celebrity. The 27 years of hell finally ended for the Moxley family. Outside the courthouse, Mrs. Moxley faced a huge mass of reporters and television crews. Through tears, Mrs. Moxley said she had prayed before court. My prayer started out, Dear Lord, again today, like I have been doing for 27 years. I'm praying that I can find justice for Martha. You know this whole thing was about Martha. She added, This is Martha's day. This is truly Martha's day. While Michael was in prison, his lawyers and supporters fought for his conviction to be overturned. Four appeals were filed, all of which were denied. Then, on October 23, 2013, Michael was granted a new trial on the basis that his defense attorney, Mickey Sherman, provided him with constitutionally deficient representation. As a result, Skakel was released on $1.2 million bail on November 21, 2013. Prosecutors fought their best to get Skakel's conviction reinstated. They succeeded years later in December 2016. Connecticut Supreme Court finally ruled over a 4-3 decision, which said his representation was in fact valid. But the case didn't close there. In May 2018, the court reversed its ruling with yet another 4-3 decision, concluding that Michael's representative, Mickey Sherman, failed to provide evidence of Michael's alibi during the original trial. Prosecutors still have the option to retry Michael, but will certainly have difficulty doing so due to deceased witnesses and other problems. Michael's legal team, in an issued statement, praised the court's decision, saying that it had done the right thing. The lawyers also said that Michael, who maintains that he is innocent, has been unjustly imprisoned. The Moxleys, however, remain certain of Michael's guilt. There's no doubt in my mind that he did it. Dorothy said. John Moxley, her 59-year-old son, said that the jury's verdict in the 2002 trial, which they reached after hearing the evidence against Michael Skakel, continued to give him reassurance. There's a comfort level on our part that we know what happened, he said. Michael Skakel is now 55 and lives with his aunt in Westchester County, New York. He spends his day taking care of his 15-year-old son, George, and doing his best to move on from the trauma of his past conviction and imprisonment. He's legally bound to ask for court's permission to travel outside Connecticut or New York. I'd like to put this nightmare behind me so I can begin to have some semblance of a life with George without all of this hanging over my head. He said in the email, I lost 11 and a half years of my life. I miss George's childhood altogether. I know I will never get those years back but I feel lucky to spend time with George now. The death of Martha Moxley was a recurring nightmare for the Greenwich community and her family and friends, which lasted over 40 long years. While many still believe in favor of the court's justice that the verdict against Michael was fabricated. But in the end, a mother lost her daughter, and the state of Connecticut failed to get proper justice for Martha's death. Many believe Michael walked away as a free man due to his connections and wealth. Martha's father, John David Moxley, died in 1988, fighting for his daughter's justice. The Kennedy family continues to gain fame from the Martha Moxley case, even now. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who wrote a book entitled Frame, Why Michael Skakel Spent Over a Decade in Prison for a Murder He Didn't Commit in 2016. Dorothy Moxley, Martha's 84-year-old mother, said the book had left her at a loss for words. She added that Truth never looked so twisted and manipulated in her entire life. She still believed that Michael was the murderer of her child. Kennedy's book devoted an entire chapter to skewing the character of John, Martha's dad. 
he questioned his whereabouts on the night of the murder and raised numerous allegations on the Moxley family. Michael Skakel remains free as of December 2019. The name of Martha Moxley is etched into the hearts of Greenwich forever. A young, beautiful girl was stripped of her childhood before she could even bloom out of her teenage years. This isn't the first tragedy that has been buried by the Kennedy men. The trial between Michael and the Moxley family was a war waged by the entire United States. And while there is still much speculation on this case, we give our deepest condolences to the family of the deceased. This alleged exorcism case has rattled this entire community. Death of that three-year-old girl. Police say she was a victim of child abuse, specifically that exorcism-like ritual. That the family tried performing an exorcism on the girl. The death of a three-year-old girl. Yes, they are accused of killing that little girl in an exorcism-like ritual. So this home also served as a church where a three-year-old girl died in an apparent exorcism. 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 On exorcism. Exorcism. Um, the victim in this case was particularly vulnerable. She was a three-year-old girl, and these were people that she trusted. Certainly for the mother, she has a duty to protect her child. On September 24th, 2021, the tantrums of three-year-old Arlie Doe took a dark turn when she was put through an exorcism by her family. Her wailing and screaming was heard only within the walls of a small Pentecostal church, Iglesia Apostoles y Profetas, in San Jose, California. Arlie Doe took her last breath during a terrifying exorcism attempt to cast out a demon, orchestrated by her own mother, Claudia Hernandez Santos, Uncle Rene Aaron Hernandez Santos, and grandfather Rene Trigueros Hernandez. As prosecutors delve into this heart-wrenching case, they reveal the harrowing details of a fatal church exorcism that shook the community. Now, with the accusation firmly pointing at all three family members, the legal proceedings aim to bring justice for little Arlie. The investigators' painstaking efforts over several months unraveled the roles of each family member, mother, uncle, and grandfather, equally contributing to the tragedy that claimed the life of this innocent child. She didn't get to live because of the very family that should have protected her. Did Arlie Doe receive the justice that she deserves? Let's find out. San Jose, California is special for its museums, gardens, and historic architecture. It stands tall at the heart of California. As of the population census of 2023, San Jose is home to 930,862 people from different walks of life. Over the past five years, the crime rate has gone up by several folds. Despite being known as one of the safest big cities in America, the crime rate per 100,000 people is currently higher than the average rate of 316.3. However, this was an isolated incident. In the name of religion, a young soul had to depart so soon. Nestled within its quiet streets, the Iglesia Apostoles y Profetas, a seemingly ordinary and small Pentecostal church, became the epicenter of a chilling crime that unfolded in September 2021. Inside the confines of this unassuming church, a harrowing exorcism took place, forever staining its walls with the dark echoes of three-year-old Arlie Doe's tragic demise. The Hernandez family members included 25-year-old Claudia Alicia Hernandez, the mother of the victim, three-year-old Arlie Doe. Alongside Claudia, the family circle extends to Arlie's uncle, Rene Hernandez Santos, and grandfather, Rene Hernandez Sr., both implicated in the horrifying exorcism that led to the child's untimely demise. Not much is known about the victim's uncle or father. The family's spiritual journey unfolded within the confines of Iglesia Apostoles y Profetas, a small Pentecostal church where Arlie's grandfather, identified as the leader of the church and a certified pastor, played a prominent role. This one is very difficult to stomach. Um, the victim in this case was particularly vulnerable. She was a three-year-old girl, and these were people that she trusts. It was her mother, her uncle, and her grandfather. The family's occupations beyond their religious roles remain undisclosed. Claudia, the mother, handled a YouTube channel where she shared her live videos. But one fact that was certain was that they were extremely religious. It was their religious affiliations that led them to the tragic belief that the child was possessed 
that resulted in such an end. On September 24, 2021, a dark chapter unfolded in the life of this three-year-old child as her family's misguided attempt to exercise what they believed to be an evil spirit led to a day of unimaginable horror. The events that transpired on this fateful day would later become the focal point of legal proceedings and public scrutiny. It all started when Arlie woke the night before and began screaming periodically. Arlie's mother, Claudia Alicia Hernandez Santos, believed that the tantrum of her child was the work of evil forces and took her to the church to perform an exorcism. Claudia, in an attempt to perform an exorcism, put her finger down Arlie's throat several times. Even though Arlie was being subjected to so much pain, she fell asleep several times in between out of exhaustion. She was being held down by her uncle and grandfather. They held her by the neck, resulting in asphyxiation. According to Claudia, Arlie's vomit was purple in color. The two-hour-long ceremony ended in tragedy. However, the family didn't attempt to seek any medical help for almost two hours after she had passed away. After almost two hours, Claudia called the police shortly after 8 p.m. to report her daughter's lifeless state. Responding to the call, the authorities arrived at the Iglesia Apostolesi Profetas Church in San Jose, a place that would forever be etched in infamy. There, they discovered little Arlie, unconscious on the floor, initiating a harrowing sequence of events that unfolded over the next few hours. Arlie was subjected to relentless physical abuse, lost consciousness, and displayed signs of trauma with injuries around her eyes, face, neck, and chest. The family's disturbing belief in demonic possession led to a prolonged ordeal for the young girl, lasting approximately 12 hours. When paramedics finally arrived two hours later, they found her lifeless body on the church floor, marking the end of a day filled with torment and anguish. The affidavit, filed in Santa Clara County Superior Court, revealed that Arlie's mother Claudia believed her daughter had died between 6 and 6.30 p.m. The family's distorted perception of spirituality and the misguided belief in their ability to expel evil through abusive practices cast a dark shadow over Arlie's final moments. The investigation into the tragic death of Arlie unfolded as a chilling tale of religious fervor gone awry, leading to a horrific exorcism performed by her own family members, her mother, uncle, and grandfather. The subsequent legal proceedings shed light on the shocking details of the whole 12-hour ordeal that culminated in Arlie's death inside the confines of the small Pentecostal church Iglesia Apostolesi Profetas, located in San Jose, California. The investigative process took a significant turn when Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeffrey Rosen filed court documents seeking to consolidate the cases of all three family members into a single trial. The rationale behind this request was rooted in the assertion that each defendant played a reprehensible role in the violence inflicted upon Arlie, making it challenging to determine individual responsibility for specific injuries. The court documents revealed the disturbing timeline of events that unfolded on September 24, 2021. Arlie's mother, 25-year-old Claudia Hernandez Santos, initiated the tragic sequence of events by calling the police to report her daughter's lifeless state. The authorities arrived at the Pentecostal church, discovering Arlie unconscious on the floor, a scene that would later be confirmed as the result of a homicide caused by suffocation and smothering. The investigation uncovered harrowing details of the family's collective actions during the 12-hour exorcism attempt. Prosecutors contended that all three defendants, Arlie's mother, uncle, and grandfather, actively participated in physically abusing the young girl. At various points during the ordeal, each family member held Arlie at different parts of her body, with one gripping her neck, another her abdomen, and the third holding her legs. The alleged attempt to induce vomiting involved a disturbing collaboration of efforts. A preliminary autopsy later confirmed that Arlie's death was a result of homicide, with asphyxia due to suffocation identified as the cause. The alarming details emerged as investigators delved into the disturbing circumstances surrounding the little girl's demise. According to court documents, the family, gripped by the belief that Arlie was possessed by a demon, 
engaged in a twisted form of prayer and exorcism at the church. Arlie's mother, in an attempt to rid her daughter of the perceived evil spirit, resorted to distressing methods. She allegedly attempted to induce vomiting by sticking her fingers down Arlie's throat and squeezing her neck, actions that escalated as the day went on. The investigation revealed a disturbing lack of care for Arlie's basic needs leading up to her death. The affidavit stated that the victim last ate on Thursday, September 23rd, around 9 p.m., and was provided with only about six ounces of water from Thursday until the time of her death. The coroner's findings further emphasized the extent of Arlie's suffering, revealing injuries to her face and neck, as well as blunt force injuries across her chest and back. Internal bleeding added another layer of brutality to the acts committed by her own family members. As the investigation unfolded, the family members faced charges of child abuse, including assault on a child with force likely to cause great bodily injury resulting in death. The legal proceedings brought attention to the distorted beliefs that fueled the family's actions, the misguided conviction that Arlie was possessed by a demon and that a religious ritual could expel this perceived evil. The court documents delved into individual statements made by each defendant during police interviews. Arlie's grandfather, the self-proclaimed pastor of Iglesia Apostolesi Profetas, provided varying accounts of the events leading to the young girl's death. His changing narratives between September and May raised suspicions about the accuracy of his statements and hinted at potential inconsistencies or attempts to obfuscate the truth. Similarly, Arlie's uncle, René Aaron Hernandez Santos, significantly altered his initial account during subsequent interviews with the police. The evolving nature of his statements suggested a lack of transparency and prompted further scrutiny of the circumstances surrounding the exorcism. If convicted, Claudia Alicia Hernandez faces an exceptionally severe sentence of 25 years to life in prison. The investigation unfolded against the backdrop of a disturbing trend. Increased demand for exorcisms, driven by a confluence of factors such as poverty, anxiety, and a lack of trust in conventional institutions. The tragic case of Arlie Doe served as a stark reminder of the dangers inherent in the intersection of religious fervor and unchecked beliefs. As the legal proceedings progressed, the call for a consolidated trial underscored the complexity of assigning individual culpability for a crime committed collaboratively. The family's statements and actions, as revealed through the investigation, provide a chilling insight into their perspective on the events surrounding the young girl's death. The family's narrative begins with Arlie's mother, Claudia Hernandez Santos, expressing her belief that her daughter was possessed by an evil spirit. According to statements provided to police, Arlie would periodically wake up at night crying or screaming, which fueled the family's conviction that she was under the influence of a demonic force. In response to these perceived manifestations, Claudia attempted to perform what she described as an exorcism to rid Arlie of the alleged evil spirit. Claudia's involvement in the exorcism took a disturbing turn as she detailed the methods she employed in a rather matter-of-fact manner. First responders who arrived at the scene observed bruising around the child's eyes, neck, and chest. Claudia admitted that they waited for two hours before finally calling 911. Subsequent interviews with investigators revealed Claudia's evolving beliefs about Arlie's possession. Claudia and her uncle reportedly prayed for Arlie while inside a bedroom. The events escalated the following morning when Claudia and her uncle drove Arlie to the Iglesia Apostolesi Profetas, a small Pentecostal church. The family still held the belief that Arlie was under demonic control. The family believed she had died between 6 and 6.30 p.m., around 12 hours after arriving at the church. According to Arlie's father, they had to perform the ceremony to liberate her of her evil spirits. The details about the exorcism weren't revealed, however. It was stated that Arlie was asleep when they reached the church. He also added, If you read the Bible, you'll see that Jesus cast away demons and made sick people healthy again, he told the newspaper. It's not when I want to do it. It's when God, in His will, wants to heal the person. The preacher is like an instrument of God. What we do is what God says. 
In the aftermath of Arlie's death, Claudia set up a GoFundMe campaign to solicit donations for burial expenses. The family's deep-rooted religious convictions were evident in Claudia's Instagram profile description, which included a reference to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through 11, a Bible verse about finding strength during difficult times. Arlie's mother added another layer to the investigation through YouTube videos she uploaded, providing insights into her perspective on her daughter's death. In these videos, Claudia did not accept blame for the alleged exorcism or her daughter's demise. Instead, she attributed Arlie's death to a divine act, asserting that God took her, and expressing gratitude that her daughter would not have to face the hardships of the world. In a bizarre turn of events, a YouTube video surfaced in January, four months after Arlie's passing, featuring Claudia Hernandez discussing her daughter's death. The 40-minute self-shot video, titled with Arlie's full name, offers a haunting glimpse into Hernandez's demeanor as she addresses the circumstances surrounding the tragedy. Hernandez's statements in the video attempt to provide her perspective on the situation, asserting that only those present truly understand what transpired. She acknowledges the negative perceptions surrounding her and the circumstances of her daughter's death, but emphasizes her inability to change the past. Hernandez expresses gratitude that her daughter is no longer suffering in a world she perceives as increasingly challenging and deteriorating. As a matter of fact, the video becomes a poignant exploration of Hernandez's emotions, revealing the pain of losing a child juxtaposed with moments of apparent detachment. She reflects on the joy of being a mother, acknowledging the sadness, tears, and longing for her daughter. The complex emotional landscape painted in the video adds another layer of intricacy to an already deeply tragic narrative. Six days after the YouTube video was uploaded, prosecutors formally charged Hernandez. The gravity of these charges, coupled with the perceived disconnect between Hernandez's demeanor in the video and the alleged actions leading to Arlie's death, underscores the complexity of the case. The family's association with Iglesia Apostoles y Profetas took a darker turn as the church was linked to another incident, an alleged kidnapping involving individuals associated with the church. Professor Allison Cavey, an expert in the history of magic, science, and religion, provided valuable insights into the broader context of exorcisms. She highlighted the increasing prevalence of exorcisms in both the United States and Latin America over the last five to seven years. Cavey pointed out challenges stemming from the Catholic Church's lack of preparation for priests to perform exorcisms, leading to a demand that is not met by qualified individuals. She also identified societal factors such as poverty, anxiety, and a lack of trust in conventional institutions for education as driving forces behind the demand for exorcisms. Cavey emphasized that when people choose supernatural explanations, like demonic possession, it often stems from dissatisfaction with natural explanations, providing comfort without the burden of blame or responsibility. In the case of Arlie's family, the tragic events unfolded against the backdrop of a desperate attempt to solve a problem they may not have fully understood, attributing it to supernatural forces. It's alarming how the family didn't express any form of guilt or sorrow even after Arlie's loss. The YouTube video recorded by Claudia before her arrest offered a glimpse into her emotional journey, from the excitement of pregnancy to the profound grief of losing her daughter. Her sentiments reflected the difficulty of accepting a child's loss due to illness, pushing individuals to seek solace in supernatural explanations. As the legal proceedings unfolded, Claudia Alicia Hernandez Santos faced charges of felony assault on a child with force likely to produce great bodily injury resulting in death. Her arrest, which occurred on January 31, 2022, highlighted the severity of the crimes committed during that fateful exorcism. The day of horror, marked by religious fervor gone awry, not only claimed the life of a young child, but also brought to light the dangerous intersection of misguided beliefs and heinous actions. The tragic case of Arlie Doe came to an end when her mother, Claudia Alicia Hernandez, was charged with felony assault on a child with force likely to produce great bodily injury. 
The severity of the allegations prompted prosecutors to emphasize the extreme nature of the actions she's accused of committing against her own daughter. The decision to deny bail was motivated by concerns over public safety and the assessment that Hernandez presented a high flight risk. Prosecutors pointed out her minimal ties to the community, coupled with her birthplace in El Salvador, as factors contributing to the perceived risk. This precautionary measure underscores the severity of the accusations against Hernandez and the potential dangers she may pose if released pending trial. The disturbing details of the case were brought to public attention through newly uncovered court documents, as neither the San Jose Police Department nor the District Attorney's Office had initially disclosed information about the harrowing homicide. The investigative process aimed to unravel the circumstances surrounding Arlie's death, with Hernandez emerging as the sole individual arrested in connection to the case. The legal proceedings will continue to unfold, scrutinizing the evidence, witness testimonies, and the chilling details revealed in the court documents. Anyways, as the justice system navigates the intricacies of this case, the focus will remain on seeking accountability for the actions that led to the tragic loss of Arlie's life. The proceedings will unfold with a commitment to ensuring justice for the young victim and holding those responsible accountable for the alleged heinous acts that cut short a promising and innocent life. As we wrap up our investigation into the disturbing incidents surrounding Iglesia Apostoles y Profetas in San Jose, the web of tragedy and criminality continues to unravel. The revelations of a deadly exorcism and a shocking baby kidnapping have cast a dark shadow over this church community. What are your thoughts on the intertwining of faith and crime in these unsettling cases? Feel free to share your insights in the comments section below. If there's a particular case you'd like us to delve into, or if you have stories to share, we're all ears. For more in-depth explorations into gripping stories that blur the lines between faith, crime, and the human experience, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Anyways, stay connected for future episodes as we unravel more mysteries and untangle the complexities of true crime.